and welcome back, however you wish to self-identify, to Nothing Movies, where we ask the question, uh, the fuck is this? It's the podcast. What, what's going on? Where we go through an actor's filmography and choose the most anonymous and culturally untalked about uh. movies that they've made and decide whether or not they have a certain something or if they're just a whole lot of nothing. I'm Kaz Lesgard, and I will be doing this entire episode with the diction and annunciation, much like John Malkovich. Yeah, well, oh, and I'm Jameson Rafter. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Welcome back. No, this, this you're not doing this for the Malkovich whole fucking is, episode. Malkovich I will walk out. Malkovich is hard to do. <laughs> yeah, it really is. You're it's doing, not... and you were doing him on like Xanax too. He Much. doesn't talk that no. slow. No, see, here's the thing: is Malkovich is such a good actor. He has like like this classically like theater trained style of talking where he enunciates every word perfectly. But he's been doing it for so long that he's able to just toss it off with a very casual, laissez-faire attitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm nowhere near as good of a performer hot take i'm i'm no john malkovich whoa so i it's, know it, i found oh. out it's hard being john it's all right malkovich. it's okay i mean it is i mean they made an entire movie mm -hmm. about how hard it is being john malkovich yeah. you were close with, i i will but, listen back to this and i will find out that i was nowhere near as close you, you, I, I, I didn't i probably don't sound anything like no that. what <laughs> you needed to do was up not the tempo so much but he manages to cram a lot of words in very little breath he does yeah yes I, so you yeah. were very close with matching the diction. That's however, what I would. That's what John I was Malkovich. going for. John Malkovich will also combine one word as if there are no breaks in the words or sentence. I would like a Cobb salad, and I would like the dressing on the side. And if you have croutons, great. But if you don't have croutons, just bring me some old stale bread and perhaps a cup of soup. Yeah, see, that's a little closer. Yeah, now there gotta, we go. Okay, now you gotta cool. throw in like a hint of that weird accent that he right. has. What is it? Russian? Is he Russian? No, no, no. He's. I, I think. I believe his like back. Background is his father was Serbian, but mm. but I don't think that informs his his accent. I think he just has like a very natural sort of like educated American accent. He's also fluent in French. Mm. He also he 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 uh, lived in France for like ten years and has done like a bunch of French plays. So maybe that has uh, something to do with it. Anyway, these are good notes, and we're starting the episode over. All right, welcome <laughs> back. This is John nothing... Malkovich impression take two. Yes, this is uh, Nothing Movies, and uh, we are uh, continuing to look at the. Nothing movies of 2022. These are movies that came out last year and have already been completely forgotten by the general public, including today's movie. And this is some fresh trash right here. It's a mind cage. Step into the mind cage, bitches. You're not going to be ready for it. You're not going to be ready for what's what's in this cage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's nothing scarier than, than the human mind, mm -hmm. let alone your mind what's inside your mind this movie is a psychological thriller mm -hmm. that has a very much in the same vein as silence of the lambs some might say exactly in the same vein as silence of the lambs it, it, inside of distinct inside difference. of the vein li literally it, it's not even the same vein as silence of the lambs like it, it's currently stealing silence of the lambs blood yeah like it's not silence of the lambs out yeah. And it, it, it it's taking blood and putting it in a freezer to store for later for nefarious yeah. purposes. And it has seven locked up in the next room. And it, <laughs> things aren't looking good. Yeah. This movie is a, basically a copycat of Silence of the Lambs with a very distinct difference. One being that the killer is an artist and not a psychiatrist. Has it been a while since you've seen Silence of the Lambs? Uh, it's... They're not quite trying to catch a copycat serial killer. In Silence of the mm. Lambs. Like, Buffalo Bill isn't copying... He was a former patient of Lecter's. I yeah, he's not yeah, copying yeah. Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. They just go mm -hmm. to Lecter because they figure, well, Lecter's crazy and he can he can catch this guy. Yeah, he can do a Because he did it before in the other book. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of how we do this. But yes, no, it's a young female FBI agent or cop. She's not an FBI agent, nope. is she? they're not FBI. No, nope, they're not. They're just like street level cops. Mm -hmm. And But there's like a, a, a young woman who, who has to talk to a psychopath who's behind bars the entire time and uh what else happened there there's a scene where the cops go to one address and it's intercut with 
uh, someone that's been kidnapped. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, but it's the wrong address. Yeah, and if, uh, if mm-hmm. I need to learn more about you and point you, point you in this direction before I can offer my assistance, that kind of mind game. And then, you know, like it has like other connective tissue with Silence of the Lambs, but like it, it's a real case of can I copy your homework? Sure, but you know, change the answers like slightly so it doesn't look like it's like a direct copy. So you know, in Silence of the Lambs, person gets kidnapped is the the daughter of a politician. This time, erase that word daughter. It's just a politician who gets kidnapped, mm-hmm. uh, and lots of other things that make you go, hmm, that's similar. That that's familiar to something that I've yeah. seen before. It's almost like they're copying one of the most famous movies ever made. Yeah. Oh, and also, uh, the serial killer themselves is not uh, a character that we see on screen. Their identity is shrouded in mystery, and uh, right. they, they, they drop little dollops of hints of who the killer might be. And, and... here's the thing, is that there, there's there's a shortage of cast members in this movie, so if you introduce the fact that there's a mystery behind who this copycat serial killer is... Every main character instantly becomes like a suspect. Yes, and us, the audience member, are going to guess pretty quickly who the serial killer is, and, uh, spoiler alert, uh... We were if, half right. We were mostly right. <laughs> Look, if this is, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, welcome. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna spoil everything. Mm. We eventually will get around to revealing the shocking twist in my shocking case. Shocking is and right. It was shocking. Oh, like, yeah. my mouth was agape. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe they were filming this, mm-hmm. that everyone involved in it agreed yeah. that this was a good ending, uh, but... This uh, is going to separate us apart from Silence of the Lambs. We will get there eventually, yeah. but yes, today we are talking about this psychological thriller uh, that features sex workers being murdered and their bodies uh, turned into... Works art, of art. works of art. They're turned into these painted angels that are adorned with gold, and it's a dive into the mind of a serial killer. And it talks about how uh, religion can uh, corrupt, uh, you know, uh, innocent people. And of course, a heady story like this stars the only person that makes sense: comedy legend Martin Lawrence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in his only dramatic movie. This is yeah. it's the it's the it, it, like you were saying on the elevator up here it's martin lawrence like you've never seen him before we truly have never seen martin lawrence like this before he Mm. has never i mean we've seen him as a cop plenty of time he does enjoy playing police officers Mm -hmm. uh so i imagine that was an easy varying levels of competence well no he's always like a good cop he's good at his job Except for that one movie where he was like a criminal pretending to be a cop. That was Blue Streak. That was Blue Streak. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think he becomes a cop. I mean, like, that's, yeah, on the sliding scale of, like, good to bad Martin Lawrence cop roles, Blue Streak is probably, like, at one end of the spectrum. Cowboys at the top. I get. I mean, like, he... Or Big Mama's House at the top. I mean, I haven't seen the Big Mama's House movie. Like, Mm -hmm. Big Mama might be a more successful police officer than than whatever his character's name in, in Bad Boys is I mean they bo- it's it's hard to gauge they both have three movies yeah so like there's enough uh, I I don't know I don't know like how like the number of wins like I know like but I think it's begging for a crossover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Lawrence him playing ag- like multiple roles like against, Allah, against like himself. Myers and I mean like- he's done it before yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, but like I'm not gonna knock Martin Lawrence for wanting to do a dramatic roles. Plenty of comedians take on dramatic roles. Plenty of comedians take on action hero roles. It's, uh, uh, it's fine for it to branch out. Yeah, a lot of but like when a lot of comedians take on like dramatic roles, they they generally do it a lot earlier in their career mm. than, than Martin Lawrence is currently doing with his first dramatic role uh, in 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, in in this. A- yeah. Above all things, that he was an executive producer. That on. he was an executive producer on in a movie that I have to imagine was never scheduled for theaters. That mm. m- that must everyone involved in this must have known this is going to end up on streaming. Yeah, like almost immediately. Um, but let's take this opportunity to talk about Mr. Lawrence. Let's talk sure. about his career because uh, it's not terribly long. So, you know, we it's not going to be like a three-parter episode where we, like, split the career up or anything like that. We can do it pretty quickly. We can get it done in one episode. Uh, we can look at the filmography. I don't... There's maybe, like, a few nominations here for, for Nothing Movies episodes, but I, we can litigate it. We can litigate sure. what sounds like it could be a Nothing Movie and what is just a 
middling Martin Lawrence comedy. Because that's the thing. Once you become like a name, once you become like a name actor within like a genre and everything like that, it's kind of hard to classify certain movies as a nothing movie. Because by our own definition, by right? our and, own and definition, we, that changes pretty frequently. Yes, that changes on a day to day basis. But after, it's hard to know what we're talking about. It, it is. It is because we're constantly moving the goalpost and we're constantly reevaluating yeah. what that means. But that will, maybe ultimately, that's what the podcast is about. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the eternal question, Jameson. What is a nothing movie? Mm-hmm. And we're going to figure that out with Martin Lawrence right now. So Martin Lawrence. Uh, I don't have anything of, of anything based on his background. Oh, I, after I, a buildup like that, <laughs> after a backup like that, I know. I just have like his filmography here. I know like a, a weird little piece of trivia about his background is that he was born in Germany. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, he stayed there until he was twelve, until his family moved to the United States, because I believe his father was in the military. Mm. So they were on uh, military for. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's just like an interesting. Huh. Childhood, yeah. uh, not something that you would expect from from Martin Lawrence, given uh, the films that he does and the the comedy that that he does. Now, of course, Martin Lawrence got to start start in stand up, mm-hmm. and and he he got TV roles and and TV gigs and movies based well, on that. He had a sitcom that. for a while, right? He had a sitcom, yeah. which we will get to. Um, that that all came out of stand up, and I was thinking this while I was writing out his filmography here and looking it up on Wikipedia. I don't think I've ever heard any of Martin Lawrence's stand-up. I don't think I've ever watched, like, a special... He's made several movies. He's made several stand-up comedy movies. Yeah. I've never seen any of them. I think, like, the the time frame for that was just... It, like, I, I just wasn't really we paying... We might have been too young. We might have been too young to, yeah. to really get Martin Lawrence in his heyday because, like, mm-hmm. his sitcom and his stand-up career, that was all in the early 90s. Yeah. And it all kind of like petered. He started really being Martin Lawrence, the movie star, around like '97, which is kind of when I started paying attention to movies yeah. in total. So yeah, Martin Lawrence's and, early career kind and, of passed I, me I, over. I can't really say anything about his comedy, but just the fact that he had that that stand-up career, and yet it's not up on a pedestal the same way that like a George Carlin or a Richard Pryor or an Eddie Murphy or or, or his Jerry con- Seinfeld, like yeah. the way that those like these famous comedians. Maybe go check out some of the early work right. because... Or I would yeah. say, you know, like, contemporaries of his that came after his start, like, say, Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle. Like, yeah, those, hard, yeah. those are comedians that, like, I was very interested in around, like, 2001, 2002. You know, mm. like, Bigger and Blacker I listened to constantly, like, the early Chappelle stuff. Definitely, but I never thought to watch Martin Lawrence. And even though they've aged horribly, I still have seen those two Eddie Murphy movies... I've even uh, watched some of the Richard Pryor stand-up specials, but for some reason, I just never got on Martin Lawrence's wavelength. And uh, bit of a blind spot. For bit you. of a blind yeah. spot. Maybe I'll watch something. Who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll love it. Maybe it'll be fantastic. <laughs> That'll be the only good that you got out of Mind Cage. <laughs> That'll be the one thing that I, that I took away from Mind Cage. Yeah. So yeah, stand-up. he started doing uh, some stand-up, and uh, some agents saw him, and he got his first TV gig. Uh, from 1987 to 1988, he appeared on several episodes of the show What's Happening Now? Uh, you're familiar with the show What's, What's Happening? Happening? Yeah, that was an old 70s sitcom, right? Yes, uh, yeah. it is, uh, I believe, the uh, show uh, that has, what's his name, Jimmy Walker, the guy whose catchphrase was Dynamite! Mm. Uh, I know a lot about these shows through, like, other contexts. Uh, Cultural osmosis. Family Guy has made a lot of jokes about what's happening. So what's happening now mm. uh, is the spinoff uh, of that. Uh, interesting, what I, what I learned, I always was under the assumption that what's happening was a question. No. But I'm looking at this now. Apparently it's two exclamation marks. So I've been saying the title wrong all these years. It's not what's happening. It's what's happening! What? Happening. Happening. Like more than one what? What's? What's? <laughs> what's are happening? No, it's what's happening now, double exclamation mark. Uh, so, double so, exclamation mark. So really it's what's really happening. What's there. happening now? Mm. Like the wave of the future. I imagine that's exactly yeah, how it was. Yeah, it was a science show. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then uh, it, it like his his film career uh, just got like a, it started like hot out of the gate. In fact, we mentioned earlier that Mind Cage is the only dramatic role that Martin Lawrence has ever played. The only movie that he has been in that is not an out-and-out comedy is his debut film, which is the Spike Lee masterpiece, Do the Right Thing. Hmm. 
Uh, he, and, but he, I mean, like, there's there's humor in that movie. He, he, like, he's not playing, like, the 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 comic relief in that movie, but he's playing, like, a loud mouth. Well, he's, like, a bunch of, he, there's, there's, like, a bunch of guys on the street, on, like, the stoop, and they're always, like, making, like, smart-ass comments and smart alky stuff yeah. and everything like that. So that's, that's more or less his role in that. It's a very minor role, but, you know, he's, he's not one of, he's not doing any of the heavy dramatic lifting in that. He's just sure. a loud mouth on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that movie, that movie is funny. I mean, lest we forget, uh, Samuel L. Jackson does play a character named Mr. Senior Love Daddy. Mm -hmm. So Spike Lee has a sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, that's fair to say. Uh, he followed that up with another seminal piece of black cinema, 1990 House Party. Yeah. Have you ever seen House Party? Is that the one with Kid and Play? That is the Kid and Play movie. I've seen the yes. poster. <laughs> oh yes, it's a very famous poster. Yeah. Uh, actually, you might be thinking of class. Are you thinking of Are you thinking of the one with the back of their head? Sure, maybe. Where it's like where it's like written into the back of like kids. Uh, maybe, uh, hair, yeah. much like the Return of Superfly. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be clad. That might be the other kid and play movie. Okay. How, House Party. House Party is the the front of their faces. Class Act is the back of their faces. Mm. Um, I I caught up to House Party a couple of years ago. I had never seen it before. I kept hearing from podcasts that I listen to that I in, in, uh, respect and I, I uh, respect the opinions of the people who are listening mm -hmm. to. Everyone kept saying, man, man, House Party is so good. Oh, man, what a comedy classic. And I'm all like, oh, really, that one passed me by. I really got to check that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, for the most part, it's a charming little film. I understand why it became so significant to, you know, uh, black cinema lovers uh, growing up because uh, it's a, a real cool hangout movie, which is, you know, just like kids in high school and stuff like that. Uh, and then the final 20 minutes of the movie, Kid Gets Arrested, and the uh, ending of the movie is literally a 20-minute rap about how he doesn't want to get butt-raped in prison. And uh, that kind of soured the movie for me a little bit. I'm not going to lie. It's all like, I really wanted to like House Party a lot more than I did, but I could have done without the gay panic. Mm. Uh, I was kind of I was a little disappointed, but you know, how like, long would that rap song have to be for you to be like, okay, I can just accept this as the end? It if, keeps it were, if it were like going. maybe like two two minutes thirty, like... it's literally the denouement of the movie. Like mm. he gets arrested, mm. he raps for a very long time about how he's scared that a big man will yeah. fuck him in the ass, mm -hmm. uh, and then play comes, gets him out of jail, and then like the movie ends, Jeez. and then his and then his dad threatens to uh, uh, beat him beat him because he snuck out of the house for the house party mm -hmm. uh so you know yeah it ends on gay panic mm -hmm. and um domestic abuse but you know it's a comedy it's fun everyone's yeah. everyone's having I fun mean, everyone's having to, a good time there's a lot to cram in with that story so if you can't shoot it on film and like draw out those scenes at least do a, like a rapper's delight-esque <laughs> 12 minute long rap song sure why not <laughs> yeah that, that won't age horribly <laughs> um but yeah martin lawrence's career just like took off like fire like he mm. he has like he, he's got like a memorable supporting role in house party the very next year, they made House Party 2, so he's back in that. Uh, 1991, uh, the year after House Party, is also his first leading role in a movie. So it didn't take... It took him three years mm. to get a leading role in a movie. And this was all just off of his supporting roles in other movies and his stand-up career. Sure. His first leading role, uh, a fantastically titled movie called Talking Dirty After Dark. Nice. Uh, which isn't nearly, it, it sounds like a, like a Skinamax, uh, movie, yeah. but, uh, it's, it's actually about stand-up comedians, uh, and I believe the talking dirty is, you know, just, more like swear words, uh, you know, yeah. not, not like filthy talking, but I don't know, I haven't seen that it. That sounds so. like a very shoot-the-rodeo kind of movie. Where like they just went, they took right. oh, the camera into a yeah. comedy club and then just filmed some acts. I have to imagine a lot of it is, uh, it's the type of movie is all like, well, we got like a comedian here. How much of their act can we put into the movie? How much and of the movie can just be stuff that they already have like written down yeah. for us? And then between the sets, like there's like a loose plot that connects. Yeah, he's probably yeah. chasing that's, after that, a girl or that's something. My, I don't know. It, that's my guess yeah. at that movie. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that. I didn't watch a trailer. It does star John Witherspoon, who's one of my favorite character actors of, mm. of that era. I love that guy. He's great. Uh, R.I.P. Uh, 1992, very big year for year, him. He has uh, a small role in the Eddie Murphy movie Boomerang, which uh, is might be a nothing movie. I don't know. I, again, we walk a thin line, Jameson, whenever we talk about black cinema. Mm -hmm. Because where, while we have maybe have never seen Boomerang, I guarantee you a lot of people are all like, that's great. That's like, a, that's like an Eddie Murphy classic. I watch mm -hmm. that all the time. Uh, it's really hard to tell. I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not part of that. You don't have your finger on the pulse of the it, black culture. I 
sadly, no. Five years into this, I still do not have my, my finger on the pulse of black culture. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it, though. I'm really working on it. Yeah. But 1992 is a huge year for him. Not only is he in Boomerang, but he also gets a hosting gig uh, of Death Comedy Jam. Oh, cool. Uh, which uh, he was the first host for that. I believe that's still a thing, Death right? Comedy Jam? I don't think they've stopped doing that. Oh. You know, if if it stopped, maybe it just was like on hiatus uh, for a while. Possibly, uh, I, I have a feeling that that was long running. Oh yeah, yeah, I, it was long running. Like it, it lasted long after Martin Lawrence stopped hosting yeah, it. But like, he was sort of like the first one to sort of kick that off. I mean, the last I heard it was probably like the late two thousands. Mm. It's been it, it was featured in a couple of uh, comedy movies, and I don't know is the Apollo Theater still around? Because I have a feeling if that theater's still around, they still do deaf comedy jams. Hey, uh, people who work at the Apollo Theater, shout us out. You know, yeah. reply to us on Twitter. Uh, shout you know. out to Sam. Ed Ab absolutely. What? Isn't he the guy who comes out with a broom and sweeps the bad comments oh, off stage? Oh, okay. See, this is why you, you're bringing the context here. <laughs> I don't know from Death Comedy Jam. I don't know. Like I said, my finger is squarely off the pulse. But 1992, he's got that. He's got Boomerang. And it's also the year that Martin starts his sitcom, mm. uh, which runs for 132 episodes. It runs from 92 to 97. So he's doing that uh, for like that solid amount of time. Now, we had a discussion about this uh, off mic uh, when we were discussing the possibility of doing this movie. Neither of us have seen Martin. Nope. Uh, but it was, by all accounts, just a juggernaut of a sitcom. Like, mm. it it did so much to keep Fox, the TV sh station, on air. Mm -hmm. Like, it really was just like this massive ratings juggernaut. It went head-to-head -head with NBC. Around the same time, um, Martin Lawrence got asked to host SNL, and he went on SNL. He did, like, a very off-color, off blue mm. uh, monologue that got him banned from NBC for, like, several oh, years. So, shit, like, there really? was, like, this big rivalry going on between Fox and NBC back in the day where Fox was all like, ah, we got, like, the most successful sitcom of all time, motherfucker. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's like this big cultural... <laughs> It's this big cultural milestone, and again, much like Martin Lawrence's stand-up, I've never seen a single episode of it. Again, I think it was just right before my time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like, I watched a lot of random sitcoms on, like, TBS Superstation growing up. I guess they just didn't have the rights to Martin reruns, because, like, I watched a lot of Fresh Prince, I watched a lot of, like, Family That's... Matters and stuff like that, and that, those were all, like, those reruns. Those were the other networks. I think uh, Fresh Prince was uh, NBC. Okay. I, I don't know how TBS works if, like, these other stations, like, rent those out to them or whatever. I, I guarantee you I watch Fresh Prince on TBS. Mm. But, I don't know, maybe my memory is, is ruining me. Uh, but, yeah, no, so, yeah, that was um, a sitcom where Martin Lawrence played a radio DJ. He also, uh, interestingly, uh, not a lot of other sitcoms did this, he also played multiple other characters throughout the show. Mm. Uh, he had, like, a, a bunch of uh, revolving characters that he would uh, bring in and out of scenes. He played his own mother. Uh, the joke with that is that he didn't bother to shave his mustache while he was playing his own mother, and everyone always commented on it. Uh, I think, like, the big breakout character from that was a female character he played called Shanene, mm -hmm. uh, who I think is, like, the breakout character from the Martin TV show. There, there have been talks for years about a uh, Shanene spinoff. Uh, she's also the uh, inspiration for the early 2000s dance craze, the Nene. Mm -hmm. That is where that comes from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen Martin... Uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, in the final year of Martin's production, uh, there was a big lawsuit from his co-star, Tisha Campbell, who made several sexual harassment and verbal and physical assault claims against Martin Lawrence. Uh, and she played, you know, she was like the second lead of that show. She played mm -hmm. his girlfriend. So for the entire last season of Martin, uh, his the secondary character of the show is not in it uh, until they reach an agreement where she came back for the uh, last couple of episodes, but she refused to be in the same scene as Martin Lawrence. Mm. So all of the episodes were like he would he would walk out a door and she would she would enter or like they she would just miss each other. They would just miss each other, which would be hilarious if it weren't. You know, due to sexual assault allegations. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were going to say that because she refused to be in any scenes with Martin Lawrence, but they didn't say anything about Martin Lawrence's mother character. And uh, there we Shanae go. Nae, who, That's right. It's all yeah. like, yeah, I'll only be in scenes with Shanae yeah, yeah. or Jerome. <laughs> uh, Jerome's in the house. Martin's out of the house. Jerome's in the house. Uh, but it, it is it, worth mentioning also that it, it appears that Tisha Campbell and Martin Lawrence have made up. 
Uh, well, they appear to be friends on Instagram now, so I guess everything's cool. Look, I'll just say, since I'm on this sidebar right now, Martin Lawrence seems like a difficult person to work with and be around. Well, isn't the outrageous Tracy Jordan character from 30 Rock loosely based on Martin Lawrence at that time? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure they probably pulled inspiration from a bunch of different celebrities. Mm -hmm. But yes, he definitely seems to have a tumultuous past in Hollywood, uh, several of which uh, I will mention in a minute. So yeah, Martin runs from 92 to 97. In between that time, 1995, he stars in a little movie called Bad Boys. Mm -hmm. Uh, the interesting backstory on that is that originally was supposed to be a vehicle for John Lovitz and Dana Carvey. They made the right choice. They <laughs> probably made the right choice, yeah. yes. Uh, I forget the reasons why they decided not to do that, but uh, yeah, and then they were, they were kind of all left. It was all like, well, because well, at the time they were like the two hot guys from Saturday Night Live, uh, and then when they fell out, they're all like, okay, well, I guess we need sitcom stars. Mm -hmm. So they went the opposite round. They got the guy from Martin, and they got the guy from Fresh Prince, mm -hmm. and that because that was Will Smith's. It wasn't his first movie, but it was kind of like his first. It was it was his first blockbuster. Yeah, is what that first was. First of many blockbusters. First of yeah. many. Yes, mm -hmm. that was sort of like uh, the big deal for Will Smith. Uh, uh, do you have thoughts on Bad Boys and the Bad Boys franchise? Never seen them. I don't really care for Michael Bay movies. Yeah, they are very. If you don't like Michael Bay movies, you won't like them because they are very much Michael Bay movies. Mm. Um, my two, my quick two cents is that the I found the first Bad Boys. Uh, to kind of be an appalling movie, I I really I, it's just full of characters who are just misogynistic, homophobic. They're always screaming at each other. Mm. They don't seem to like each other very much. It's just an obnoxious movie. Bad Boys Two is all of that, but also it's secretly maybe the best movie Michael Bay has ever made. Oh, There's really? something very weird about Bad Boys Two where you watch it and you're all like, "Fuck, there's a lot of movie here." Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of have to respect what he's the going ambition? for, okay. uh, the ambition for it. It's the type of movie where you're all like, oh, thank God that's over, and then it keeps going for like 45 minutes. Where does it stack up compared to Pain and Gain? Because that's the Michael Bay movie I like. Uh, I think Pain and... Well, look, Bad Boys 2 is not a good movie. Okay, all right. Um, it, it's a very... A, of, it's the most Michael Bay movie Michael Bay has ever made. Okay. Uh, is what I will say. Mm. Um, I don't know. I like maybe it's maybe like his fourth best movie. I think Pain and Gain <laughs> is better. Armageddon is better. Okay. Uh, something I can't remember. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Anyway. So yeah. But Bad Boys, huge blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Uh, massive for Will Smith. Also quite big for Martin Lawrence. Uh, you know, like he he becomes. A big ass movie star. Yeah, from... he can start getting more high profile yeah. starring. He's roles. got the most successful TV show on air currently, mm. and he has one of the biggest movies in the world. So, what does he do next? He directs. Mm. His only directorial feature It is a movie that he also stars in with a absolutely labrug. Lab lab laborious? Laboratory? Lab laborious? A laborious title. Yeah, yeah. Uh, truly a mouthful. He directs a movie called A Thin Line Between Love and Hate. Ooh. Uh, that is uh, a dark comedy. Uh, I believe he marries a woman who turns out to be like a stalker. So it's kind of like a, a riff on like a fatal attraction mm. type thing. Haven't seen it. If we ever do a full trilogy on Martin Lawrence, I have a feeling that's definitely that's on the docket. Nice that's not a movie that anyone remembers with any sort of, um, familiarity or, or love or whatnot. But 1997, uh, this I feel like this is where like Martin Martin Lawrence the the comedy partner era pops up because he has a whole string of movies where he's like the other guy he he's either the guy and there's another guy with him or there's a guy and he's the other guy he's with so, Martin Lawrence so it okay. starts with ninety seven with uh, nothing to lose which is the natural partnership of uh, Martin Lawrence and uh, Tim Robbins hot off of the Shawshank Redemption okay. I think like Tim Tim Robbins comes home one day, finds that his wife is cheating on him, and then Martin Lawrence is a carjacker, and uh, instead of giving him the car, Tim Robbins kidnaps Martin Lawrence, and then they go on like a crime spree. I think that's what that movie is about, based on my bad recollection of okay. what's going on. Mm -hmm. I just know they're on the poster and they're back to back. Gotcha. And Tim Robbins is really big, and Martin Lawrence, he's very short. He's a very short guy. Mm. That's where the humor comes. One's big, one's small. 
1999, as we mentioned, he's in the film Blue Streak, where he's a criminal and he pretends to be a cop. Mm -hmm. That movie played endlessly on TBS Superstation. Oh, yeah. I haven't sat down and watched that movie from beginning to end, but I've probably seen it in segments. I've probably seen the entire movie in segments at this point. Yeah. Uh, he's also back with Eddie Murphy, but this time they're both above the title in the uh, dark comedy Life. Yep. Which uh, I uh, got my mom to take me to see that in theaters, and uh, you know, I figure it's all like, oh, I, I like Eddie Murphy, I like Martin Lawrence, and you watch it. It's actually kind of a very depressing movie about uh, two two guys who who they're are like wrongfully imprisoned. They're right? wrongfully imprisoned. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, as the title suggests. They kind of don't get out of prison. They kind of spend their entire lives in prison, and it's kind—it's kind of a bummer. Mm. Uh, but uh, I remember it being okay. I remember there being like a, a good back and forth between Eddie and Martin. Um, I have sure. to imagine those are like the two biggest egos on the planet. So it's not terribly surprising that they only made two movies together. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was definitely the bigger of the two. Two thousand is when everything changed. Of course, two thousand was the year we met Big Mama. Mm -hmm. And, and the industry was, was forever altered. Mm -hmm. uh, also with Big Mama's house uh, came the news story of uh, Martin Lawrence uh, slipping into a three-day coma after he decided to go jogging with the Big Mama suit on in order to get into character. Yeah. He collapsed on the highway, and he was in a coma for three goddamn days. Jesus Christ. Yes, so That's he's... dedication to the role. Again, right? he's a bit of I a... I get wanting to, like, get used to the movements and maybe get used to the weight of the costume, but, I mean... Can you imagine if Martin like, Lawrence had died? Would this died be like in the and... middle of like L.A. too? One of oh yeah, oh, it geez. was in a very populated area. Very Lawrence hot environment, not the greatest air quality. No, it was a, it was a bad judge of character on, yeah. on on his part. Uh, Can you imagine if he died and it was because of Big Mama's house? At the end of that movie, there's a, a memoriam. <laughs> well, I don't even think they had started filming the movie yet, oh. so it just would it just would have been we would have been denied mm. Big Mom. We never would have met her. Yeah, and what a what a sad world it would have been. Mm. Uh, 2001, he's in two absolutely terrible-looking comedies. He's in the time travel comedy Black Knight. Oh, yeah. Where he goes back to medieval times, mm. uh, and they don't know what to make of him, because mm. he's like a, a black man from 2001. Mm. What are we going to do? That movie's probably racist as hell. Mm. Uh, but I've, for some reason, I've never been compelled to watch it. Go figure. Don't know why. <laughs> uh, speaking of, um... Uh, another long ass title uh, to go with a <laughs> with a double feature with uh, um, a thin line between love and hate. He's in the 2001 comedy. What's the worst that could happen? Mm. With uh, Danny DeVito, I believe Martin Lawrence plays a jewel thief. Uh, Danny DeVito is the guy he's robbing, and he gets what caught. What is by the worst th thing that could happen? What is the worst thing that could happen? This movie mm -hmm. is is what every review said yeah. at the time. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah, a terrible thing to name your movie. Don't don't Just give, inviting trouble at that don't point. Don't give the critics fuel mm -hmm. for, for what you're about to say. Uh, and then it's more toss from here. 2003, Bad Boys 2, Secret Masterpiece, National Security, where he's partnered up with Steve Zahn. I, mm. I believe they are security guards who want to be cops, that okay. old chestnut, and they right. probably it's probably like a, another bad action comedy. 2005, Rebound. He, this is this is where we enter the sort of like family friendly era of right. um, of Martin Lawrence. He's coaching a, a high school basketball team in this one. Hence the title Rebound. Rebound. Two thousand six. Big Mama's House two uh, is also his first voiceover performance. He's in the animated film Open Season, where he plays oh, a yeah. bear. Oh yeah. Uh, never seen that movie. Doesn't look good. No. Seems like a waste Awful of time. Design. Yeah, yes. Really oh yeah. Uh, keeping with the animal theme, 2007, he's in Wild Hogs. Mm. He is one of the titular Wild Hogs alongside John Travolta, Tim Allen, and, of course, William H. Macy. Mm. As four dudes, you start a motorcycle club, weekend warriors, that type of stuff. Gotcha. Wild Hogs. It's just a fun title to say. Yeah, I'll never watch that movie in a million years. <laughs> 2008, he's in the Disney film College Road Trip, mm. where he and Raven Simone hit the road. To college! Mm. Donny Osmond's in the car. Why is he there? Who knows? Know. All right. uh, he's also in a film called Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins. What's with him and picking movies with awful fucking titles? Just like, just Jesus. full sentences. <laughs> he's, all, he's all like, not enough. Not enough words. Mm -hmm. he, he looks at the script. He, it's like a two-word script. He's all like, not good enough. He yeah. like throws it over his God shoulder. Damn, like, are you saving money by not hiring a marketing team here? Yeah. 
Uh, I have no idea. I watched the trailer for Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins. I have no idea what the plot of that is. He goes home. Okay. His dad's James Earl Jones. Mm. Uh, he's got like a family. Monique is his sister. Mm. He doesn't like him. That's it. <laughs> okay. uh, 2010, he's in one of the weirdest remakes to, to ever come out of Hollywood. He's in uh, Death at a Funeral, uh, oh. which is a weird case where they remade a movie that wasn't that old, that also wasn't that good. And they remade it, and they used basically the exact same script, and the only thing they changed is that it's a black family instead of a white family. It's American family instead of, like, a white British family. Is that the one where they have Peter Dinklage in both versions? Yes. And plays the same and character? And Peter Dinklage plays the same character. Yeah. Who, who, the character, I believe, is named Peter. <laughs> uh, so, yes, the the the, that, the movie is that. Very is that rare distinction. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. The, the father, the patriarch, has died. Yeah. And uh, it's revealed throughout the funeral that Peter Dinklage was his secret gay lover. Yeah. And everyone has a, a, a big old, whoa, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. I remember um, seeing the trailer for the original and be like, I'm probably not going to watch that. And then I remember seeing the trailer for the remake and I'm like, wait a second. Did what? I misremember that with a <laughs> white cast? Dreaming? What happened here? Uh, yeah. Am I, did I predict the future? Did they like not make that first one with the white family and they change it to a black family? <laughs> Am I, in the ma- people Am I in the Matrix? Is this a Mandela? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that what's happening mm-hmm. here? Did I Mandela a, a, a racist is this version a, of this? Is a Bear situation uh, that I find myself yeah. in? <laughs> but no, it's a, just it's, it's just a weird case all around. Like it's, it, and I, I can't even say one is better than the other because I've seen both, and they're literally the exact same script. Yeah. They basically didn't change anything. They just like the only difference between the two of them is they let Chris Rock riff a little bit. That's mm. really it. That's really the only difference. Okay. Okay. Uh, 2011 uh, is, uh, you know, we, they needed to complete the trilogy, of course. It's Big Mama's Like Father, Like Son, which is another terrible title. Oh, Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah, <laughs> that's the triple bill right there. Yeah. A thin line between love and hate. Welcome home, Roscoe Jenkins. What's the worst that could happen? And then maybe uh, Big Mama's colon Like Father, Like Son. And then he has an eight-year gap in movies mm-hmm. uh, where he doesn't make any any films uh, or really Seems kind like of... he needed a fucking break. He, he probably needed a little bit of a break because he actually doesn't do much of anything. He does make a failed TV sitcom uh, in the line. He does return to TV yeah. to try and gain some of you know that glory back from the Martin days. Uh, he makes a sitcom with Kelsey Grammer called Partners where they're oh. both lawyers... He's 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 like a he's like the serious lawyer and Kelsey Grammer's like the ah it's the you know it's like playing off of like their personalities a little bit. Oh, Kelsey so Kelsey Kel- Grammer's the wacky one. Kelsey Grammer's the wacky one in that. Oh, yeah, uh, nice. that did not take off. That only lasted ten episodes. Yeah, uh, and then he proceeded to not make any movies for a while. Hmm. Uh, when he came back, he came back uh, in a in a really fun movie that's not everyone's cup of tea but his return to movies is in 2019 uh, with Harmony Korine's film The Beach Bum. Which, if you haven't seen that, that's just a, a, an entire movie where um, Matthew McConaughey gets drunk and stoned and kind of, like, stumbles into a bunch of, like, wacky characters. Martin Lawrence plays a character it named... Sounds like his life. It's basically, <laughs> it, it, it's more or less based on, on Mar- Matthew McConaughey's real life. Mm. Uh, uh, Martin Lawrence plays a character named Captain Whack, mm. uh, who, who runs a, a boat tour... Uh, I believe he gets his arm bitten off by a crocodile in that, if I'm remembering that correctly. Okay. I'm trying to remember things uh, about that movie. That uh, Zac Efron has a hairstyle that makes him look like a panini. Uh, Snoop Dogg is basically playing himself, but he's playing a rapper named Lingerie. I'm just remembering weird things about the the beach bum. It's pretty fun. There's no, if you want to watch a movie with zero plot, mm. it's pretty good. Um, and then, of course, in 2020, he made Bad Boys for Life, which secretly was the most profitable movie of 2020 because no well, one was counting yeah. on the fucking pandemic <laughs> happening. And then that movie ended up making more theatrical money than any other movie. And it was the first movie released. Mm-hmm. It was the first blockbuster released in 2020. Mm-hmm. It was like the second week of the year. Yeah. And Stop it, the count! <laughs> and it just stayed on top for mm-hmm. the entire time. Wow. And, uh, well, yeah. Good for you, Michael Bay. And he went well actually Michael Bay was only a producer on that movie. Good for you, Michael Bay. My good for you, Michael Bay. And uh yeah, and then he took that goodwill from Bad Boys for Life and he took it he took it all of it and he put it in a cage. Mm. In a, a mind cage, cage. Mm-hmm. Which and is a better title than half of his filmography, I guess. It, it it gets to the point. Mm-hmm. I mean I mean like mild spoiler, there is a literally a mind cage in this movie. 
You could yeah, you could say to a degree. you could say to a degree. To a degree. But let's get into it. That's that's the career. That's like, Martin Lawrence's you know, a career. Another thing to say about John Malkovich. I thought we were gonna split this between talking about Martin Lawrence and John Malkovich. Let's say He's the jo- one with a more robust filmography. Well, yeah, but that's why I didn't talk about him because then we'd still be talking about him. There's so much to talk about John Malkovich. He's done so many things. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I feel like I just we... wanted an excuse to talk about Rounders. <laughs> it's one of my favorite well, movies. Do you want to have a Rounders corner? <laughs> no. Let's have a let's have a mild Rounders sidebar here. The only thing about John Malkovich that I want to point out is that this is one of five direct-to-DVD movies, or I guess direct-to-streaming movies, Mm -hmm. that he released in 2022. Oh, boy. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Malkovich, I guess, needs some cash. I guess so. Uh, Pay that man his money. (laughs) (laughs) And with that, I will take a break. (laughs) I just wanted to look up the the five direct-to-streaming movies that Malkovich has made in 2022. Uh, since we're on the subject of the, of the uncovered movies. Since we are on this, yes. So he's in a film called Shattered. Mm-hmm. Uh, another psychological thriller. Yeah, another psychological thriller. Yeah. Uh, I believe in that he gets murdered with a katana. So, you know, that's someone's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in what looks like a sci-fi movie called Chariot. Uh, he's in a, another action thriller called White Elephant that stars Michael Rooker and poor, poor Bruce Willis. Oh, and uh, perhaps most shockingly, he's in something called Savage Salvation, uh, which is him and Robert De Niro. Oh. De Niro, you don't need to be in, in, in this type of shit. Are you not getting no, paid? John Malkovich. Is he not getting? I mean, but John Malkovich d- doesn't either. But like De Niro really doesn't. He really but I doesn't mean, need to be in I don't that. know. Maybe actors of like a certain age they get bored. They just get bored, and they just like doing the. I mean, I can understand why John Malkovich said yes to Mind Cage. Mm. If, if some, if his agent was all like, you get to play the Hannibal Lecter type. I'm sure John Malkovich was all like, mm, say no more. Finally. Yes. <laughs> it's been long enough. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about Malkovich yeah. another day. Yeah. Malkovich, as I've as I've just proven, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to talk about a yeah. movie that doesn't exist that Malkovich is. Consider in. Consider this a warning: you will be featured one day on Nothing Movies. All right, Malkovich, you're on blast. Yeah. All right, and you're on blast until we come back from this charity spot. Stay tuned, everybody. There are currently 67 countries that have jurisdictions which criminalize same-sex sexual activity, and 11 of those jurisdictions can or do impose the death penalty for people having same-sex relationships. Many other countries criminalize the gender identity or expression of transgender people, charging them on accounts of impersonation or disguise laws. The Human Dignity Trust has been defending the rights of marginalized members of the queer, trans, and non-binary community for a decade, challenging and changing laws that persecute people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. They work globally to support strategic litigation against inhumane laws and work with LGBTQ plus activists around the world to defend human rights in countries where private, consensual same-sex relationships are criminalized. They work to make sure local activists and lawyers that live within the communities are always the first to lead and inform their work. And since 2011, they have helped activists and civil organizations across five continents receive almost 20 million worth of pro bono legal assistance. Since this kind of work carries a great personal risk to a person's safety, they also connect local activists with international security experts. To make a donation to the Human Dignity Trust, visit the link in our show notes, or visit humandignitytrust.org slash donate. And we're back! Mind Cage! Mm -hmm. It's the type of title that, like, (laughs) makes me think, like, like, speaking of Peter Dinklage, it reminds me a lot of, uh, Space Pants. Oh, yeah. Space Mind Cage! Get it by mind! It's a mind cage! It's a cage of mind! Yeah, anyway. Uh, it's directed by a gentleman named Mauro Borelli. Mm. Uh, he's mostly a concept illustrator for other movies. He's been working in the film industry for several decades. He has been a concept artist on films such as 
The Godfather Part 3, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Last Action Hero, Batman Forever, Godzilla, Psycho Remake, Sleepy Hollow, Planet of the Apes, Hulk, several of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and Star Wars The Last Jedi. That's a pretty robust career, Indeed. I must say. So he's a bit of a he's a bit of an artist himself. Oh. You might say. He draws things and then other artists turn them into film. And now he's a natural choice to direct this. Yes. Well, you know, other people have moved from one industry to the other. Other people said no. To other the other people said no to that, yes. Uh his first film as a director is from two thousand. It's called Goodbye Casanova. The uh, plot on IMDb is uh, pretty wacky. It doesn't really tell me much about uh, what uh, what actually happens in the movie. Uh, an aspiring writer and his talented painter wife are getting a divorce when the legendary Casanova and his lover Lavinia are released from a 17th century children's book. Uh, apparently, the divorce triggers this release. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what happens after that. Uh, I don't know if they, Hijinks. I don't Hijinks know if, if, if Casanova gets with the painter wife or if, if they switch partners or if they teach the lovers to love each other. I don't know anything. All I know is that this movie stars Baywatch's Yasmin Bleeth mm -hmm. and Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers oh. together at last. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a little strange there. Huh. Uh, from there, he directed a handful of, uh, straight to DVD horror movies with titles like Branches. Haunted Forest and The Ghost Maker. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, and then in 2017, he did the sci-fi movie The Recall, which is an alien abduction movie that stars Wesley Snipes and the uh, son from Breaking Bad, R.J. Mite. Okay. Uh, and then he had two movies that came out uh, last year, 2022. He has uh, Mindhunt, this movie, and he has Mind another Cage. movie. Another movie. What did I say? He said Mindhunt. Mind Hunt, Mind Cage. Yeah. Mind Hunt is the David Fincher show. That's like actually good. Mind Hunter. That's that's what it is. Okay. I I'm gonna I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna put other lots of other words behind mind yeah. in this because just it, it's a simple title. It's not terribly memorable. Yeah. I don't have Mind Cage in my head. Yeah. I should. In I need to lock. I need to lock it down. Mm. <laughs> uh, but yes, he made a film called Mind Cage, and he also did another movie called War Hunt. Oh. So he likes certain he likes certain uh, certain structures of titles here. <laughs> that if you say them fast enough, yeah. sound like my cunt. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Oh my. Oh. oh. Yes. Well, yeah. He couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't call the movie Mind Hunt. Mm. That would have been. That would have been too much there. Uh, that movie stars Mickey Rourke and uh, another person from this movie that we just watched. Robert Nepper is the yeah. star of that movie, who we last saw on this podcast as the tortured writer in DOA mm -hmm. who committed suicide. For one scene. <laughs> and uh, if you Google Robert Nepper, uh, total scumbag. This guy is no, no good. He's not no a, good. He is not a nice man. Okay. Uh, I I would I would. Absolutely choose to spend an afternoon with famously difficult Martin Lawrence much more than Robert Nepper, even though I'm sure he would be very nice to me. He is not nice to women. Uh, uh, the last thing that I will say about Mauro Borelli is that the last three movies that he made, The Recall, War Hunt, and Mind Cage, have all been written by the same person, Reggie Kiyohara III. Mm. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, the, it's the natural pairing. It's the, it's the Bombach and Gerwig, the... the uh, what's another... Director, writer, pair. Neil Simon and Herman Ross. I don't know. This is a more obvious one that I'm thinking of, but I can't <laughs> fucking... Kushner and Spielberg. I don't know. Come on, Jamie. Butt in here with the plot of Mindhunt, because okay. I'm, I'm, right. not, I'm not going to stop. You know me long enough that I'm, once I get on a tangent like this, I can't stop unless you literally force well, me out of it. you're welcome to shut up right now while I tell the Well, here. thank you, and now I'm going to feel bad because you hurt my feelings. Oh, I, no, no, buddy. 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 Mind cage. Mind cage. Mind cage. All right. <laughs> well, so we we open up with the um, the depiction of a corpse that's been painted up to look like uh, this really ornate angel, and it's been discovered in a church, and so they call it in to the uh, uh, to the local cops. We were laughing a little bit when the opening credits were happening because there is literally a credit for the a angels by mm -hmm. is the credit and it's it's crediting whoever art whatever artist that, who was just focusing on the makeup and costuming of the angels. We were laughing at that as the movie goes on. I'm all like, no, they were right to credit whoever this person is. This is the most impressive thing about the movie. Sure, yeah, is these is these corpses exactly and yeah. like. 
not to dovetail us all the way back to Silence of the Lamb or like the Hannibal TV bro, series. Bro, bro, we're going to go there. <laughs> Trust like, me. The most interesting <laughs> and disturbing things about those, um, what, what would you call those killing pieces where like someone is remade to look like, you know, a, a work of art, even though they're morbid and they're macabre, they're like, the, I don't know if there's a technical term for it, but I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think killing pieces is quite, sure. it's quite apt uh, mm. for, for what that is. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think it's a thing that exists in real life. I think it's I a hope thing. Not. I, I hope not. I think I think it's a not. thing that I w- I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, and there aren't a lot of serial killers who like display their victims to be that takes, found. I mean, that's the suspension of, dis- of disbelief right. because, like that, I imagine would take a shit ton of time and yeah. luck to and, make sure no one spots you doing this. Kind and of in stuff. the few cases that I can think of where like a, a killer has left a body behind to be like mm. discovered and everything like that, they're either you know they're not doing it to like you know they're not like the fucking riddler they're not like leaving clues for like the cop they're not like mr policeman i gave you all the clues or yeah. anything like that they're not doing that also in like the few cases that i can think of at the top of my head that someone has left a body behind for like someone to find they almost immediately get caught not soon after because you know forensics is a real thing that exists in life and <laughs> yeah. mo- most they can most, probably track this down yeah most most quickly, police yeah. officers working mm-hmm. within like this yeah. this particular crime division are you know smart people yeah. who know what they're doing not always sometimes yeah. they're idiots but, but you know but like these killing pieces these art installation displays mm-hmm. they are quite impressive looking they spare no expense on making these things look hauntingly beautiful but they, uh, you never get the sense from like the Hannibal show or Silence of the Lambs that these are like you know just so foreboding um, mm-hmm. Like the tone is there, but with none of the uh, the craftsmanship to make you have that sense of yeah. dread and like the real horror is like the stuff that you're piecing together in your mind, right? And I mean like the big suspension of disbelief for the Hannibal show, which I gotta admit is which is great. Even just talking about it now, it makes me want to go back and start rewatching it because yeah. it's just so much fun. <laughs> but the big suspension of disbelief is that. Every murderer who lives in this one particular town where Hannibal and Will Graham live happens to be like a um, massive conceptual artist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're always doing like these big like display thing. They can never just like toss a body in the gutter. Like yeah, it always yeah. has to be like on a top. totem pole. A totem pole or, or of bodies stitched together. Yeah, right? they, they can or never a just like by like the eighth time it's just gonna be all like oh, okay. God, just 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 a simple just a simple stabbing, yeah. please. That's all I want from yeah. today. But anyways, they're calling in these uh, these angel displays and. The two main costs on the scene are, uh, I, I want to say, like, the rookie officer, uh, Mary Kelly. Yes, her name is Mary Kelly. Yeah. Uh, she is played by uh, Melissa Roxburgh, uh, who's a Vancouver actress. Is she? Yeah. Yes, I, I noticed that by this. I, I noticed that by uh, looking up her uh, IMDb and uh, seeing all all of the usual suspects. She's in uh, Legends of Tomorrow. She's mm-hmm. she's in uh, the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she's also the lead of that Netflix show. Um, what is it called? Uh, Manifest. Mm. Where all the people go missing on the plane or whatever. It's like yeah. another lost ripoff. Right, where it's all yeah, like yeah. someone involved in a plane and someone involved in a mystery. There's an overarching mystery that yes. hopefully will get paid off before the show gets canceled. It, pretty much, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this movie wasn't filmed in Vancouver, but there's a lot of like interesting Vancouver connections. She's a Vancouver based extra. Uh, that piece of shit, Robert Nepper, also, he's not a Van- he's not from Vancouver, but he does live in Vancouver. So, oh, no. uh, yeah, uh, Robert Nepper, if yeah. you're listening to this podcast, stop listening. <laughs> it, it's not for you. Mm-hmm. It's truly, it, the podcast yeah, is for. I recommend it to like 10 of your friends, but you stop listening. <laughs> sure. If you have any we friends need, left, we need listeners. You're not a good guy. Uh, so, yeah. So she's one of the cops on the scene, and so is the the veteran detective Jake Doyle, played by Martin Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he is a troubled officer. He uh, he recognizes this case as very similar to the works of a uh, as a famed serial killer that he put away five years ago. And the case uh, was it was an exhaustive search. There were countless murder victims, and uh, it cost him the life of uh, of his partner. And uh, he's just a, a wrecked shell of a of a of a human being. Yes. Yeah, and he's uh, and he's reluctant to jump back into this case, and he won't even entertain the idea that oh, it's is it just another copycat? Is it like the artist that we like? That's the name of the original serial killer. Is it him killing again? John John Malkovich. Yeah. Uh, his name is Arnold Laferve. 
even though uh, everyone pronounces that Le Fervre. Le Fervre. Because uh, no one knows how to pronounce the French. Yeah. The and, uh, but for the, for, for the most part, everyone refers to him as the artist. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though Hannibal Lecter didn't have a, a... Well, no, he did. He was Hannibal the Cannibal. But yeah. they only said that, like, once. They only yeah. said that, like, one time. And, and that's kind of a lowball of a nickname. Yeah, for exactly. Too, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, serial killers tend to not... They tend to not give themselves their own nicknames. The nicknames are often, like given to them by the the press or mm. whatnot. That's why there's there's that um there's the subplot in in the other Hannibal Lecter novel Red Dragon mm. where, you know, the serial killer wants to be called the Red Dragon but everyone's calling him the Tooth Fairy because he bites people and it's all like, I'm not a tooth fairy, I'm the dragon mm. and he gets all pissy about it. Yeah. Uh but uh <laughs> I believe Arnold Lefebvre yeah. uh, has gi- has given himself the moniker of of the artist because yeah. and, and like he's pretty much like embracing that character yes. because he is the high minded pretentious artiste. Mm-hmm. Now uh, it should be said all of the victims in this are sex workers, mm-hmm. which is an unfortunate trope of this type of stuff. It's unfortunate because you know it happens in real life. Very often serial killers prey on. Sex workers, because mm. more often than not, they're, they're an easy target. They're an easy target, and, and not everyone's always looking for them. You mm. know, like they, they, if they go missing, certainly most uh, police uh, forces wouldn't wouldn't be as geared up as the people as as the the good police in this movie to to actually mm-hmm. investigate. You know, drug addicts and and sex workers and and whatnot. So. You know, it's just one of those things where you're all like, oh, this is really unfortunate. It's it's reinforcing a stereotype that's maybe not a great one, but also it has all this basis in reality. So I suppose I'll allow it. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, when it's in like a like a, a shitty streaming movie, like Mind Cage, you're just kind of all like, oh, this is a bit hoary, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I don't know what my opinion is on that. I just, you know, it's just, it's just like... We're just going to have to put up with it. We just need to support sex workers, and we just need to protect them so that John Malkovich doesn't turn them into angels. Mm -hmm. We need to do it, because that's the biggest problem that's facing sex workers today, Mm -hmm. is that a pretentious serial killer will take them and turn them into... Casing them in plastic and poisoning them and... Resin, I believe it is. Resin, yeah. And then putting them in angelic poses and and leaving them around He gives them all like like uh, alabaster skin mm-hmm. i think i believe that's what the resin does it like dyes their skin white yeah or something of that nature mm-hmm. uh yeah so yeah there's a there's a copycat killer on the loose uh sheriff robert nepper wants to wants to put <laughs> sheriff yeah, sheriff he, nepper here's my thing about sheriff nepper in this uh, in this movie um he seems like a highway patrol <laughs> sheriff yeah and not like you know, the chief of police or, like, the lead lieutenant of the city police force. What are you force. talking about, Jameson? He has a big cowboy hat. Yeah. That's how you know he's the sheriff. That's how you can tell this movie takes place somewhere in the south. <laughs> yeah, what did they say where this movie takes not. place? I kept no. looking for, like, the sides of police cars to say, like, New Orleans or, yeah, it or felt, something it, like that. Yeah, it had kind of a New Orleans vibe. Mm-hmm. And there is a voodoo priestess in this movie. <laughs> not that that goes anywhere, but it does sort of feel like a New Orleans-type situation, even though there's nothing really... Yeah. Um, aesthetically, yeah. to draw uh, the the idea that this is like a New Orleans type thing, but it might have been a more interesting movie if they sort of leaned into that. I I mean I can hazard a guess as to why that was included, but I'll save it sure. for, for later. Oh, the the voodoo priestess. Yeah, I got some theories on that okay. too. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, Officer Kelly, who is basically the audience cipher because she's constantly asking questions about the case. Oh she yeah. Did no fucking research on this case before she was assigned to it. Well, it's the that's the hoary screenplay. A cliche. I've seen. I'm saying hoary a lot. Yeah. But which which that which horror is on the brain. Which which counteracts my insistence on referring to them as, as sex workers. Yeah. I'm just, these I'm people look. have dignity and they have a hard life. <laughs> Anyways, these whores. <laughs> these whores over here. They're no good. Um. But, but yeah. yeah she... No. But it's the it's it's the bad screenplay cliche of of their sitting in the briefing room. The briefing room and Robert ne- Sheriff Sheriff Nepper, mm. which is what I'm going to call this character from now on. Mm. Sheriff Nep mm. is going over this mm. and and yeah and and uh Mary He's talking about yeah this is a repeat of the case 5 years ago. You know, we don't want to like scare the public in and she's and she, like I'm I'm sorry uh chief. What, I'm, what? I'm a little fuzzy on the details. What? Could you go over them in incredible detail for my benefit, please? Yeah. I think it's pretty safe to assume we have a copycat on our hands here, folks. Sir. One with a rather intimate knowledge of his predecessor. Uh, excuse me, Sheriff. Yes, Detective Kelly. I didn't realize that there were other murders connected to this case. I assume Jake filled you in. 
Okay, here's a Cliff Notes version from five years ago. Serial killer Arnaud Lefebvre, a.k.a. the artist, abducted and murdered six women. First, he poisoned and preserved them using the rice and extracted from the cast of beans. Then, he arranged and decorate the corpses in lifelike poses using metal frames, leaving them to be found in various places around the city. I do actually remember that. It was before finals, so the details are a little fuzzy. How did you guys end up catching him? Uh, and there's so many scenes like that where she's all like, oh, could you refresh my memory? It's all, it, it stops just short of her going like, as you all know, yeah, and then yeah. she says something that she would never say in a she million years. She should have been like, all right, you're off the case. You're, 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 you're you off. haven't done the basic research yeah, necessary yeah, for all police work. Serial killer case. Like, oh, she even at one point he says like, um, yeah, uh, Martin Lawrence, she should have filled you in on this, and she immediately throws him under the bus for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, Martin Lawrence is her partner, mm -hmm. and he's the one that put the artist away in the first place, mm -hmm. and yet, seemingly, that's never come up once. Mm -hmm. I mean, the movie also doesn't tell us how long they specifically have been partners, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, she never seems to know anything yeah. involved in the case, even even information that, as a police officer, she she should know, because it's just the, yeah. the, the, she, the basic information. I mean, she's constantly saying, like, oh, he's he was late to an appointment, he didn't fill me in on this stuff. Like, she's really trying to stab him in the back and climb up the uh, the ladder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she, she has the bright idea of, like, hey, maybe we should go and interview the artist, because he might have some opinions on this copycat killer who's going around, you know, trying to one-up his work or whatever, and... Uh, uh, Martin Lawrence is against the idea. He, he slams he slams his fist down on the table to, to show for it. to show that he's acting to show that this is this is a new Martin Lawrence that you're getting. This is a new serious Martin Lawrence. Did you not like Martin here. Lawrence in this movie? I think, I think he was trying. I, I think he was. I I think out of the the major performances in this, I think he's the most distracting, mm. largely because he he has never as as the filmography that I have just gone through mm. probably implies he's never been the strongest of actors no he's mm -hmm. a comedian and he plays off of his already built-in comedic persona mm -hmm. so to immediately do like a sharp turn left into like a serious psychological thriller like this i don't know like, unbelievable. So, something needs to be like a little bit different about him and mm -hmm. he's he's just giving us martin lawrence just without any without any jokes mm-hmm uh, this time around. Oh, so, fair, fair uh, yeah, so uh, they get into the the worst green screen I've ever seen <laughs> in their in their yeah, car. Man, I, I long for the days when they used to just set a car on the back of a truck and drive it around a city. Probably block. would look better. Yeah. Uh, I occasionally want to keep going back and forth to the IMDb trivia for this because okay. some, sometimes there's not a lot in here, but uh, I got some real gold mm. in here. There's a couple of things I wanted to spot. Like, cause we were talking about Martin Lawrence. Uh, this this is a user submitted piece of trivia for oh, IMDb. Boy. Director Mauro Borelli was initially surprised that a producer suggested that he cast Martin Lawrence, a comedian, in this movie. However, when Borelli met Lawrence, he liked the sound of Lawrence's voice, and because of Lawrence's stand-up background and ability to remember two hours worth of comedic material, Borelli believed that Lawrence would be easy to work with. That's just what. That's not even trivia. That's not even trivia. That's just like someone. That's that's not even interesting. Like that's just, like. That he can remember two hours of material. I mean, and he liked his voice. I have to imagine. Martin Lawrence doesn't have that distinct of a voice. He sounds really. like a guy. And I am, have to imagine that most other actors are able to remember two hours of material. Well, hey, what do I know about Martin Lawrence's performance in this? Because according to this, to pre to prepare for his role as a traumatized seasoned detective, Martin Lawrence put on weight worked with an acting coach, and employed the method acting technique. <laughs> the method acting technique. I love how that's worded. It's oh, literally, it, have you heard of this? Have, have, <laughs> this is like a new thing oh. that they're trying here. Uh, I love, I love, I, th this really feels like Martin Lawrence submitted that himself. It's yeah. all like, oh yeah, I, I put on weight for the role. Yeah. That's what I was, I yeah. I work that's what I had to address me as put on, Doyle on Put on set. weight. He's, he's, he's doughier now, sure, but... Bad Boys for Life was making that joke as well, too. It's mm. just all like, yeah, Martin Lawrence, just, you know. You're a little older than you He's like in the 50 90s. or whatever, yeah. so of course his body looks like that. That's how people age. Mm. I don't know. Oh, well, good on you for, <laughs> for putting in the work, putting in the time in the kitchen. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so yeah, they go to see uh, the artist, and uh, Jake Doyle has his fourth cup of coffee in 20 minutes. <laughs> the movie really front loads his coffee addiction. Oh. I, I kept expecting it to go go back, but uh, no, it's all in these first 20 minutes. Yeah. I was about to say, drink every time he has a cup of coffee. Drink every time he has a cup of coffee that clearly has no coffee. Yeah. Uh, pretty much you can just substitute that for drink every time the word copycat is mentioned. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so they go to uh, to interview um, the artiste, the artiste who uh, looks like Alan Moore. <laughs> well, he looks like John Malkovich with a big fright wig on. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, he takes a look at the crime photos, and he is uh, he's not really bothered that someone is imitating his work. He doesn't seem to mind whatsoever. Hmm. He seems pretty content about uh, his legacy being intact, and. Uh, but he, he does offer to... Oh, what? John Malkovich being unreasonably chill and nonplussed by something? That doesn't seem something like him. creepy. That or... doesn't seem like him at all. Mm, he, that's he, not his MO. He's always someone that, that tends to overreact in every single situation. But he does offer his services in helping catch the killer on the condition that his... Uh, he, like, he's sentenced to be executed. He's got a lot of pro quo. Yeah, he has a lot of pro quo. He has a lot of front-loaded pro quo yeah, right out of the bat. Change my sentence from execution to just life in prison mm -hmm. and give me back my art supplies. And, uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. Yes, it's mm. it is non-negotiable. <laughs> and he has my favorite line reading of mm. of the movie here, mm -hmm. where where he's like saying is all like you need to you need to uh, commute me from from uh, death sentence to life imprisonment or whatever. Mm -hmm. Where he he strings like a couple of sentences together really fast. Where he's just like my death is fast approaching. Thank you, Sarah. And then he like yeah. walks away. That's very good. That's all like that's my favorite line delivery John Malkovich does in the movie. <laughs> Reminder that my hour of death is fast approaching. Thank you, man. And, uh, you know, as opposed to where, you know, Hannibal Lecter had all of this secure, tight security around mm. him and everything. He was behind, like, a glass cage. You, you, were, you were told immediately, you know, like, you, you got the severity of Hannibal Lecter. Mm. And he's all like, don't, don't hand him anything. Don't, don't put your you know, yeah. hand inside, like, the cell or anything like that. Well, because he, he'll bite you. He'll eat you. The artist is just in, like, a big old, tiny cowboy saloon Jane cell. It looks all yeah, like. Yeah, he can, can reach you through the bars at and point, stuff. At one point in time, he takes like a, a, a bust hmm. of someone's head that he sculpted out of clay and he just passes it through the bars <laughs> and I know those aren't lifelike I know it's not the size of like an actual human head but, but it's like pretty close <laughs> like a ch if a ch here's the, here's here's the deal if a child can fit their head through the bars in your jail hmm. your jail's not good enough <laughs> T closer bars please that's what my tax dollars are paying for yeah People uh, just walking, skinny people just walking through it here. Mm. Anyway. And, and much like Hannibal Lecter, he wants to peel back some layers on the officer. He wants to get oh, inside sorry. her mind cage. He wants to break into her mind cage. Mm -hmm. So he he's asking her a lot of pointed questions, mostly around her faith. Or her lack of faith in general. Yes. So. Uh, now, we forgot to mention, like, the weird relationship that d Detective... Uh, Kelly? Sally? M Mary, Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly, Mary Kelly. Uh, yeah, uh, she has like this very weird relationship. She has like, I guess a husband. It's her husband, right? A uh, husband or fiance. Husband or fiance, yeah. and uh, we we get like this early idea early on that that like there's like some sort of like past trauma associated with religion. Uh, it turns out that he he's he's planning like a romantic getaway to where Vatican City, the most romantic place yeah. on earth, the most yeah mm -hmm. the, the, the top um, I mean, tourist I'm sure, destination. I'm sure it's a cool city to go to, but it's not at the oh, top I, of my list of places to go in Italy. No, I'll walk around the Vatican, see yeah. what, what's going on there. But yeah, maybe not a romantic getaway or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and we also learn that uh, her father is dying, and she refuses to see him for reasons mm -hmm. or whatnot. But uh, yeah, uh, both both um, the artist and Jake bring up the subject of religion throughout this movie, mm. and she always uh, reacts uh, like like they've basically they've just like spat in her face more or less. Yeah, yeah, uh, massive overreactions almost instantly mm -hmm. uh, in both cases. And like it, hell, I'm I'm no yeah. holy roller, but usually if people are going to talk to me about a religion, I'll just be like, eh, thank thank you, thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll consider it. I'll well, she's got her you. reasons. Yeah, she has her backstory. She's got her. She's got she her has backstory. her tragic we, backstory. We will get to her, but. Uh, 
We will get to it, but not with a fervent attitude that the artist wants to get at it. He wants, he wants, to, he wants to climb inside. Exactly. And so after they meet with uh, the artist, a random hobo attacks. Mm -hmm. Random uh, hobo poor, poor attack. Mary. Yeah. Uh, at first, it's just sort of very menacing, just sort of like knocking on the car window. Like, yeah. Like, uh, get away from me! And then, and he, then he shows up at her house later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the third time, he he just straight up has a gun. It's a hobo with a handgun. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So that's like a, a, a reoccurring thing that's that's going on. Yeah. And, like. Every once in a while, like, by the time you forget that it happens, a hobo will just show up, remind you that he's in the movie, and assault this poor police officer, and you're, you're left wondering, what is this guy's connection to the case? How is he involved somehow? Spoiler alert, it's not that interesting. No, not at all. No. I mean, he's just one of many red herrings. Like, this movie has, like, so many red herrings. Her fiancé is a red herring. Martin Lawrence is a red herring for most of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, but... And, 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 like, I mean, the clues that they offer up for that is that because the, the, the case of locking away the artist was so... Uh, mentally taxing on Martin Lawrence and seeing his uh, his former partner uh, douse himself in gasoline yeah, so and lighting should... himself on fire after they apprehend uh, the artist. Yeah, that now he's emotionally f and right. mentally fragile, and because he's a cop, he has access to all the uh, the evidence in the lockup. So it's like, okay, well, he's a pretty prime suspect there's, here. There's like a moment where like where Detective Mary is talking with Sheriff Knapp and he, Sheriff Sheriff Nepotism. And he's nepertism. he's saying that uh, yeah, does Robert Nepper ever get accused of nep nepotism? That's you know what? Still that joke's still not as bad as the things that Robert Nepper has done. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Nepper is saying like like well the thing that Jake never told you is that he spent three months in therapy after putting the artist away, mm -hmm. and that's made to, made to be like this big reveal, and it's all like yeah, he watched his partner die, like that's it, it's perfectly natural that. That go, all cops should go to therapy. That that yeah. shouldn't be like like a weird like stigma or whatever. Yeah. Like that. But especially a cop in his situation, mm -hmm. it, it's not like it it's is. not weird at all that he that he like takes pills for like depression or whatever. I I imagine that comes with a job. I have to imagine that's fairly common too. Yeah, but this movie really wants you to make you believe it's all like, oh, he's twisted. Mm. Oh, it's a, it's a clue. It's mm. a clue to what possibly might be having that he's taking medication. Mm. It's all like, yeah, we, yeah, that's normal. Yeah, that's the thing that normal people do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the movie really leans hard onto it. Uh, blah blah blah. I mean, like, yeah, the, the whole idea of like. Like, we only see the killer from behind. They're wearing a hoodie. It introduces, yeah. like, this mystery element and stuff. Mm. So, naturally, we as viewers are going all like, okay, so it's going to be... Someone we've met. Someone we've movie. met mm -hmm. at this point. Like, who could it be? And when there's, like, this few characters in mm. it, there's really only, like, a couple people it, it could be, unless they're doing, like, a, a truly wild twist, which, spoiler, is kind of what they yeah. end up, what I mean, they end we, up doing. We suspect the fiancé husband because... He is very devout. He is a very devout Christian. Yeah. Um, we find out exactly, like, to what extent. Um, but also he has access to a couple of things that are found on the the angels when they're, when they're discovered. Like, we found that they're like, oh, they're bound in... In sage at one point, and he's lighting sage in their uh, in their apartment. When he's Coincidence? When he's, yeah, when he's preparing a nice dinner after uh, after she comes home. From it's work. kind of a weird thing to do. He 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 says it's to like drive away like spirits or or like like bad energy. Yeah, is what he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is what the traditionally the yeah. the burning of sage is. And the head doctor at the uh, the insane asylum. Oh yes, the doctor the doctor Chilton. Doctor Chilton the, character. Yeah. yeah, he's uh, he's fascinated by the mind of the artist to the point where he faked like a self harm report so he could be kept under like a very watchful guise. And so it's like, oh Jesus, it's, it's like the inmate running the yeah. asylum kind he's of thing. Too he's too beautiful. His mind is too beautiful. It must yeah. be studied. We, we put should, in a cage. We should mention that the artist does suffer from. From these odd um, epileptic fits yeah, or whatnot. Or, or, so whenever he sleeps, he seems to be uh, twitching at, at most and uh, after mumbling to himself under his breath, which is the only time John Malkovich has ever not spoken with perfect diction. Yeah, um, and, and, and the doctors a week like it's some kind of like result of a brain clot uh, that he suffered after an accident as a child. So uh, we can't figure out what it is, but it's it's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Detective Jake takes Detective Mary to an exorcism seminar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what did I write down? Uh, which I, cause I get, cause the other thing is that we've been learning yeah. that like Martin Lawrence hasn't really let this case go. He's become somewhat of an expert on 
like uh, hell and like the occult and like Religious how imagery and yeah how it relates to like Lucifer and the angels and everything like that. Mm. Like he's read books and everything. Like, he he has all of like and he's gotten like a little into not mysticism, but he's gotten like a little into spiritualism, mm -hmm. I guess, because he takes her to see. I guess this exorcist it, buddy of his. It's just like some famous monk. Yeah. Who's well known for his exorcisms. And he just so happens to be in town. And right. he's like fully in like the monk robes and yeah. everything. Um, and Martin Lawrence introduces his partner to to this this exorcist, this monk or whoever. Mm. Uh, I guess like she's under the assumption it's all like, okay, maybe this person has like some information on the case. But no, Jake uh, just like earnestly asks if he'll perform... An exorcism. Or, 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 not an exorcism, no, no. but some sort of rite or passage to, like, get what he says, get, like, the bad energy surrounding mm -hmm. her to go. It's an odd request coming from Martin Lawrence, but, yeah. like, I guess we're led to believe that, like, this is what this character, Jake, is is kind of all about. Uh, and she, like, Im she immediately freaks out. Mm -hmm. And, like, uh, I guess we can skip ahead to, to sort of say that uh, her connection to... Her her averseness to religion comes from her father being something of a religious fanatic mm -hmm. when she was a kid. He yeah. would, like, burn his hand on an open flame until, like, the flesh was, like, dripping off of it. And yeah. he said, like, it didn't hurt because, like, God was with him. Or some such like, nonsense this, as this that. This is what burning flesh is going to look like, and it's going to happen to you in hell. So just right, like, this is what... Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the weird part of this is that, like, he started taking her to see a priest when she was a kid. The, the priest is her husband. Yeah. And I guess they started a relationship that turned into, uh, like, a romantic relationship. That's, like, weird and icky for, like, a, a, like a couple of different reasons. Yeah. Like, why like, he was, like, an older authority figure. I forget exactly why they went to, uh, went to the church, but... Um, I don't know that's why... What the artist really works it out of uh, Officer Mary... That, yeah, that's uh, the lamb screaming moment of, of, of yeah, the thing. It's all like, this is, this is what I was waiting for. This is what I need yeah. to hear from you. And, uh, this changes everything. Yeah, and you feel bad for luring this man of God away from the church. And now we're meant to, uh, are we implying that because she lured him away from the church that now he's committing these murders uh, in the name of like some penance or... It's I, such I, a it's, complicated backstory to give to a character who has like what? Like four lines? Like there's really nothing to this fiance character mm. whoever he is like he's not like he's not important to the nope. story he nope. only exists to be like a maybe this guy yeah, but they don't give him a scene yeah, forced to be like a misdirection but it's a very complicated backstory it is that requires a lot of explanation and at the end of it you're kind of like oh hmm ha. well hmm. that's a little that's a little unpredictable yeah. uh yeah um, but yeah back to like the um she, the, <laughs> the monk who's in town um <laughs> I mean, like, she is somewhat right in saying, like, this is a waste of time. There is a serial killer on the loose. Yeah. So what are they doing, like, you know, taking time out to go check out, like, this this exorcism stuff? There are some moments where it seems like Martin Lawrence is trying to throw her off the case. After, yeah. after the second time the, the hobo attacks her in her house and they chase her away, they get a call through the squawk box that, like, oh, the, the killer is struck again. And because, like, she's, you know, uh, an op she's on the case, yeah. she's likely always on call, but Martin Lewis just says, all right, you know what, you, you rest up, for you t get some yeah. rest, I'll take care of this myself. And it's like, mm, mm, no, she's still, like, an active body on this yeah. case. There's a lot of, uh, like misdirection things where like Martin Lawrence will do something that's like suspicious and mm. then but then eventually when we find out what the twist of the movie is it's all like well there was no real reason for him to do that mm. or say that again it's just more red herring nonsense that the movie is throwing at us to like cloud our minds or whatever like there is a, like a big reveal mm. that eventually ties into what Martin Lawrence is doing mm -hmm. but it never like the dominoes never like fall into place the way that I feel like the, these filmmakers want it to. It's yeah. not like this tightly wound machine mm -hmm. or or anything like that. And there's also scenes where Martin Lawrence is entirely by himself, much like when he goes to visit a voodoo priestess. Yep. <laughs> now, let's spend some time talking about this. What is your theory on this? Jake... I, I can't talk about it without revealing the spoiler of this movie. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah. then I guess we'll get to it eventually. But yeah, all, uh, all there is is like a really brief scene where Jake goes to... A voodoo priestess, and he's he's just like in the crowd. He's mm. just like in the the back of the room. He's like applauding quietly to himself. Mm. And the voodoo priestess, I guess, takes control of 
of an, of an audience like member. Yeah. yeah, she she has like a, the doll. She has like the voodoo doll, mm -hmm. and it, it's just like a brief voodoo demonstration. Mm -hmm. And then the movie moves on from that, and we never return to that character. Never comes up again. And I guess does kind of tie into what ultimately happens, but I but think not. You just spoiled it. No, no, no. Wait, no, I didn't. I left it vague enough. It's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine. No one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah. So more prostitutes yeah. get killed. Yeah, they, I keep, they keep finding new angels. Like one's uh, stacked onto the front of a train. One's out on a boat in the middle of a lake. They keep going back to the artists, and he gives them these enigmatic clues and riddles, which basically uh, amounts to check the body for for clues. Yeah, look look for stuff. Yeah, he's he, like so he says that like. You gotta check the wings. You gotta, yeah. you gotta look at the wings because there's stuff in there. And she finds, she finds the clues within the wings. And then like the artist has like this, this tossed off like line of stuff like 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 the, the 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 CSI team missed all of my clues in the wings before. And it's all like really, That's a they missed it. Shitty CSI. They missed it every time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I guess yeah. yeah this the time clues you are always just like go. Oh, a little birdie told me, but they clipped its wings or something like that, or it yeah. flew too close to the sun. And she's like, oh, did they chop off the wings off the one corpse first, and then they rummage around and they find this discontinued nail polish thing that's it's connected to her because it used to be her brand of nail polish but it hasn't existed in a yeah, while and she decides to keep it what the hell is that it's a nail polish brush the shape was discontinued years ago you could tell all that just by looking at the cap no this is the exact shade that i wore in high school my father hated me for wearing it i'm gonna need to take this okay uh and then they find <laughs> this this is some this is some real uh, bullshit uh, uh, prop giving in, in a movie and stuff like that. The, 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 one of the other clues is uh, the needle from the personal compass of Martin Lawrence's ex-partner mm -hmm. who killed himself and uh, who, who, as Martin Lawrence reveals, uh, he carried this compass everywhere with him. He, he, he never left home without it. Mm -hmm. That's a weird ass thing to carry around. Yeah. Like when you live in a city. Yeah. Like what do you? In what, the era of GPS. What like, do you need that I for? I get if you're going camping or you're doing like orienteering or whatever, but yeah. they're not. But the only reason. <laughs> why it's a compass is because it ties into like the next clue yeah it ties into the, the fucking jig the jigsaw trap or whatever that the artist pulls in because like the, the compass is there yeah and then martin lawrence is all like let me go get that that hand from from uh another compass yeah from um evidence mm -hmm, yeah. and he, he he just like places it in there and it starts like like clockwork, the like gears start moving and everything. And it it's all like to the next clue, which is conveniently in the room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all like, and and even that is more red herring. This stuff because it's all like, well, how did Martin Lawrence know to do that mm -hmm. specifically? Yeah. Uh, the answer is because he's in a movie. Yeah, and it's all like, we need to we need to keep but the train had, rolling. They had to include that because you know the, the artist being the. Uh, the intellect man full of mind games that he is drops the uh, the line now what does a compass without a needle symbolize in disorientation i say it's someone who has lost or their way a, a compass without a needle or a needle without a compass and at this point i'm going like fuck oh, off god man. Come damn on. it mm -hmm. we are who are we the sphinx from fucking <laughs> from mystery men here yeah uh, 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 she starts having nightmares that are like right out of a Nine Inch Nails music video. We were laughing at that. It's just like that thing where like the 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 dead body of the sex workers are like lying there, and then their head starts moving, but like and their eyes open but, up, but like the... way too fast. Yeah, yeah, quick zooms, quick cuts. Yeah, it's very. It's again, it's something that you would see out of like a David Fincher directed music video. Mm. Uh, yeah, I wonder where they got that imagery from. Um, let's see. He mentions that you can find some clues in like the fan letters that people have sent me, but uh, this is like a weird thing. So yeah, like, what's, what's all that about? He has like a bunch of letters that uh, you know, like fans of his work have sent him that seemingly only he has read, mm -hmm. and he won't let anyone else look at them. I'm pretty sure everything that gets delivered to a serial killer gets like inspected Open. and like scanned mm. like they would have copies of all this they have like a hard drive with all of these letters on it mm. but it's revealed later that uh he's burned all of them mm. and he's flushed the ashes down his toilet and he's committed everything to memory he's he has a perfect memory it's only guy. you'll only get the the information it's inside my mind cage <laughs> and i'm just sitting here going like who gave him that 
bitches. <laughs> he's got like the biggest cell I've ever seen. He can walk in and out of the bars if he mm. like sucks his tum tum in. Mm. He has all of this stuff. They give him all of his art supplies, so he has all of these sharp pencils mm. that he could stab with someone and steal the he keys, has all whatever. His life drawings around. And he just yeah. has fire. Mm. He could set anything on fire. He could set the building on fire. He could set his got, mattress on got fire. Paper and wood. This and is a <laughs> dumb police station. These mm. are dumb cops. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they do nothing right. Mm -hmm. um, they don't check the body for any other clues or yeah. anything like that. And then they do. <laughs> they yeah. let things come and go from evidence, you know, like willy nilly. He just I couldn't believe he just has a book of matches. Yeah. And everyone is all like, oh yeah. Mm. Yeah, he has matches. Yeah. yeah, sometimes he just like lights them and like watches the flame, but it's all like, why did he? Who gave him that? <laughs> He murdered 12 women. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, he, yeah. sends him on, he sends him on these <laughs> elaborate wild goose chases, check down like forged paintings, which are only meant to like lead people back to his home, like the home that he, the serial killer, yes. lived in while he was like committing all these grisly murders. And, and we it's get... like, you didn't check this place beforehand? <laughs> right. And we get the flashback. Yeah. Uh, where he was like a kid. Mm -hmm. Well, his mother was... Uh, she was a hooker. She was a hooker and out, out of their apartment or whatever. Uh, and he, you know, he was a little artist boy. He was really good at drawing even back then. But he draws a picture of Jesus. And, oh, Mama doesn't like that. Mama doesn't like Jesus. She doesn't like religion. It's going mm -hmm. to fill your head. You should you should just get into whoring like, like your old, <laughs> like, like like your your old, old ma. ma. Yeah. Uh, and and she shakes him and he falls down and he hits his head, which makes this the second movie in a row where someone... Oh, I gave it away, didn't I? Uh, fuck. Uh, we'll strike that from the record. We'll strike that from the record, but like head trauma, mm -hmm. uh, we'll come back to that. Yeah. yeah. Oh god, <laughs> you've probably guessed it by now. I don't know, but we'll we'll, we'll keep it. We'll, we'll I'll keep the reveal later. Anyway, maybe I'll just bleep that out. I, I think what can I be talking you about? Got, you gotta cut that, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who insisted we gotta keep people in the dark about this. Oh, whatever. It's a podcast where we spoil movies. <laughs> um. Yeah. And then, oh my god, what happens next? Anyway, uh, nominous painting. That, yeah. yeah, so they, I mean, they go, they go and check out, you know, the, the mom's house, and they find her that she was the original victim of yes. uh, the artist Angel thing. Just a very and, funny and so like, line. Oh, hey, this isn't like the lieutenant governor that we were looking for. Right. This, this corpse has been here too long. It's we, decomposed into a full yeah, skeleton. We did forget to mention a fairly important piece of the plot is that uh, the the copycat has been going around and he's been murdering sex workers, much like the artist was murdering sex workers because you know his mom was a sex worker, mm. so he hates sex workers and everything but now the copycat has kidnapped a lieutenant governor mm -hmm. uh it's quite confusing because like we just see like this woman riding her horse in like the forest mm -hmm. or something weird like that and then the copycat jumps out and grabs her and it's not until like a passing line of dialogue like 10 minutes later that we find out who this woman is like there's mm -hmm. never an introductory scene yeah. where she introduces herself or says what her whole deal is yeah like maybe uh, she was in a press conference yeah, or something but yeah. now yes now the copycat is as as kidnapped someone prominent it, it he is broken from the mo mm -hmm. uh what what could this possibly mean mm -hmm. there's a very funny scene where they break into the artist's house and they see his skeleton mom lying yeah. there and martin lawrence <laughs> is all like well that couldn't possibly be the governor and it's all like, no yeah, shit no, no shit <laughs> It's a it's it's a skeleton. She's been there for a while. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, so that that's happening. Um, the the hobo uh, tries to kill her again with a handgun. He's a hobo with a handgun. Mm. Uh, and he takes a tumble over the balcony, yeah. and that's when he find out he used to work at the prison. Yeah, he used to work I at the. I thought for sure that that was Martin Lawrence's old partner. That like maybe like he faked the uh like the report that his partner mm. died, and, and now he's right. he's in hiding or or in something like maybe he knows something about the case. No, he was uh, an orderly at the insane asylum, and he was in constant contact with the artist. And I suppose the artist broke him mentally. You spend mm. enough time with this guy, and he'll drive you insane, and. Uh, He'll he'll be your puppet master or whatever, what have you. He'll get inside your mind cage. He'll get inside your mind cage. Uh, yeah, we do the whole like where the lamb screaming Clarice thing, and mm. this is all happening hilariously while the artist is sculpting 
Officer yeah. Mary in let, clay. Let me sculpt you, and I will tell you everything. She's like, you have ten minutes. And after the ten minutes are up, he after, presents after her the, with after a the, flawless looking yeah, model. After the ten red. minutes, which are like a movie two, mm-hmm. you know, it's all like it's not remotely ten minutes, yeah. which is which is going here. Yeah, and he turns it around by hand. He sculpts her face. I was just thinking, like, how funny would it be if he like turns it around and it's just like a terrible like yeah. child's <laughs> just, like she's got oh, like stick, you suck. She's got, like stick arms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the and then are massive on and her. then he hilariously hands this clay bust <laughs> of of her face through the bars and says like take this with you and she does mm-hmm. like and what are you like gonna this... do with that later like oh, yeah it's like what you you gonna you put that on your mantle yeah. to watch it for later it's like oh that's what's what's that like, well, funny story about this yeah. piece so, but anyways <laughs> here's your bus uh the killer hap- I know exactly where he lives he lives at this address though you should probably know that the answers that you're really looking for lie within and we're like oh more religious you know hokey nonsense yeah. right and so all of the cops go off except for detective jake who waits behind mm-hmm. to to drive her home yeah. mm-hmm. uh and yeah as they're in the thing she thinks about uh, she's in the car mm-hmm. and when they're in the, when they're in their their green screen paradise <laughs> yeah. uh she's thinking about what the artist is saying and he says like the real answer lies within mm-hmm. and so she starts digging through this clay fucking bust mm-hmm. and yes there's a piece of paper with the actual address yeah. of the murderer yeah. on it. She's like, uh, Detective Martin Lawrence, you know where this is? And we're all just like, yeah, yeah, it's his fucking address. So like, we'll, 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 and we'll then like, that over. Yeah, and then like... Was oh, this the part where they get to, to the house and there's that massive bug that was kept in the shot there there was this one this is one of like the only this is how boring this movie was is we we're watching this the movie technical together mistake. last night yeah. it's not even a technical mistake it was just kind of like something that in the background that it was it was my it was my fucking jfk moment where i kept rewinding mm. the movies so i could see this but yeah like at first i thought it was a technical gaffe but she's just walking into a building and there's a white pillar next to her and i guess just a really big cicada or something mm. was just like on the pillar because like you see like this little black speck and then like it half a second later, it's all like whoop and i'm all like the fuck was that yeah. it's like did you see that mm-hmm. you're like what and it's like hold on and i'm all like back and to the left and you're there. like what was there. that and then we like what we like did this for like five minutes it wasn't five minutes but like it felt like that i don't know this is how boring this movie is is like we that that got like a, a, a burst of energy out of us. It's all like, oh, I mean, let's. I mean, <laughs> it's a bug. <laughs> we, we've seen this movie before. It's Silence of the Lambs, just yes. told very boringly, it, with with none of the uh, before, no, right? none of the filmmaking. Exactly. Here's here's yeah. the thing: is it, you know, like if you're just doing, I mean, like the Silence of the Lambs is, is a great crime thriller with like horror elements and everything like Mm -hmm. that but on top of that like you can make a very pedestrian movie out of that book out of that screenplay Mm -hmm. Jonathan Demme was a brilliant fucking director and he made like a cool movie a, a moody masterpiece yeah and the yeah. camera has like interesting movements and there's all like this like fascinating close up and there's mm-hmm. like the performances and, and everything it's all like that was a movie yeah that movie won best picture mm-hmm. this movie is mind cage <laughs> it got released it, on streaming it won nothing in the di- in, well you know the, the awards aren't over yet yeah that's true yeah <laughs> oh man <laughs> so they uh, they go into the, this murder farmhouse it's in the middle of nowhere they find that bottom floor has all these pictures of detective mary like all over the walls she's like uh, in, implying like pictures of her husband implying it's all like maybe it's him maybe it's the yeah. priest husband who has had like four lines so far and she calls him up and no answer so <gasps> he could be anywhere could be uh, so she says uh, hey martin lord so, uh, call this in i'm gonna uh, inspect the basement and, and then uh, they split up. They split up. Because that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and then she investigates the basement, yeah. and that's where the senator is. Mm-hmm. And we're still, here. Still alive. Still we've alive. Got, we've gone into it now. Okay, yeah, yeah. so truly... Unless unless you've pieced it together through through uh, me fucking blurting it out just one, now, one plot point. we are about to spoil the huge fucking twist of of this Mind movie. Cage. So. And like, well, um, you know, this movie borrows a lot from uh, Silence of the Lambs. Hold on, hold on. It, Before we get into it, I, I know we always end the podcast by saying, you know, like, in, in, in our rough roundabout way, would you recommend this movie? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll get to it eventually. But, like, I just want to ask, does the twist of this movie make you want to recommend it to people? Just so they can 
they can witness it for themselves. Because it's kind of a myth. Because like I was, I was gobsmacked when it happened. Uh, yeah, maybe skip to this part in the episode if you want to stay in the dark and check it out. Oh, for will this be the first episode that we include time codes? Maybe in the description. Um, I don't know. Find out. We'll find out. Um, um okay, we're here. Yeah. And I, you know what? I've talked long enough. You, you do the. Uh, all right. Jameson. So one of the other plot points of Silence of the Lambs is that Hannibal Lecter escapes his imprisonment during that movie. In a way, that happens here, too. In a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, she finds the senator lady uh, tied up to the table, still alive, and she says, where's where's the killer? And she's like, oh, behind you. And she manages to I mean, to she doesn't out. say it like that. She says, like, he's over there. Yeah. Like she says she's, she's very, like, dazed and out of it. It comes off as a little bored, but, yeah. like, yeah. And so, like, he's right there. Yeah. She, yeah. she pulls the gun out and just catches him in the shoulder or whatever and, like, C come out from behind the, the corner. L let me get a good look at you. And, uh, and we're like, hey, we called it. There he is, Martin Lawrence, with a devilish with a, grin. With a everything. big, evil smile on his face. Yeah. Where it's all like, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, like, all right. Uh -huh. At the very least, maybe we're going to get, like, a little bit of energy out of Martin Lawrence now. It's mm -hmm. all like, yeah, this, really was, this really was, like, the most obvious Tw twist killer yeah, that I this was, could be. I was about to have a, like. I was about I to pat have... my. I was about to pat myself on the back. I, I was gonna. Am I gonna have to have another talk with Kaz about getting some real movies with some energy and some interesting twists in this again? Well, guess what, listener? Um, that ain't Martin Lawrence. I mean, it is, and it isn't. It so isn't, it isn't, he it isn't. so he opens his mouth. But but Martin Lawrence's voice isn't coming out of the it. The lights the, are on, but the, the someone else is home. The voice that that director Mario Borelli fell so in love with and told him that <laughs> this this actor could play this role. That's not the voice that comes out of him. Mm. Martin Lawrence's lips are moving, but it ain't him. Yeah. It's it's the John Malkovich. It's the educated enunciation of the artist himself, John Malkovich, Martin Lawrence. Mm -hmm is delivering his evil killer monologue, but John Malkovich's voice yard, all is way. coming out of him. Mm -hmm. And it is because the he artist is able to possess people from afar. By drawing them. By drawing if them. If he draws your portrait, mm -hmm. he can take control of your body. Jake, what's wrong with you? Oh, Jake's not here right now. No prison can hold a man who's free inside himself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mother destroyed all my art books, forcing me to find new subjects to draw. That's when I discovered my power. After capturing someone's likeness in a drawing, I can leave my own body and temporarily enter theirs. Holy shit, Jameson. Mm -hmm. We should have gotten here a lot earlier because now I don't want to talk about anything else yeah. other than this. N with this that is a revelation. Yeah. All those moments where he's convulsing while he's sleeping, that's him possessing people. Yep. That's him he doing the murders. And he's had this ability since childhood. That knock to the head is what caused it. Right. And as I was alluding to earlier, this is now the second movie we've done in a row where someone gains superpowers after a blow to the head. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I said, this is the part where I should have said that. Yeah. Uh, yes. But, um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so that's fucking crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, here's, here's a question I have for you. Uh, probably one of several questions. If he always seemed to have the ability to do this, why didn't he commit every murder by possessing other people. Why did he himself be the guy who assembles the angels in the original case for him to get captured and sent to prison? He could conceivably have just possessed anybody he sees randomly on the street because he's got that photographic yeah. memory. He can always just sketch people from memory. That's right. He can just sketch some rando and then it would be isolated cases where multiple people are committing the same murder over and over again. I guess because he wanted... Notoriety? He wanted notoriety? Yeah, because like, cause his big gambit is that, like, okay, I, I got them to commute my, sen my sentence from, from the death penalty to just, like, life in prison. Mm. Now I get, like, this free ride, free, free prison food mm. for, like, the rest of my life or whatever. I can do my art and stuff like that, and I can continue the work. Mm. I can continue the killings, and no one will ever know it's me because who, who would believe such an improbable situation yeah. as, as, as this? Okay, but no, you're absolutely right. If he was, if he was like, any other type of... Uh, I guess it's just ego. I guess it's just serial killer ego. Sure. Like he, he needed to be 
mm. uh, you know, the the boogie down yeah. or whatever. People know his name now. Well, they kind of know yeah. his name. But they they this, mispronounce his yeah. name, but, but they in this relatively grounded serial killer drama thriller. Yeah. Superpowers exist. We get this goofy, magical ending where John Malkovich can go into people. But that kind of plays into why the scene of voodoo was shown earlier. I guess. This is a, that's this, a big old I guess, Jameson. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the concept of people controlling other people exists in this universe. Right. Now... It's a real thing. Now, do you think that was uh, Detective Jake... Going to see like the voodoo stuff to gain like information on his case, or was he being possessed by the artist when that was happening? Well, we've seen before that when he is in possession of a he's, detective, he's, he's, he's wearing, wearing his black hoodie. hoodie. Yeah. yeah, he's wearing his black hoodie. Yeah, he, yeah. he goes to where when he goes to a strip club to pick up a stripper. He, which, which also, by the way, probably doesn't. I bet you have to remove your hoodie or move the hood at least when you go into a strip club. Yes, that security needs to have a good look at you. Also, strippers and sex workers, not the same thing. Yeah. The two completely different professions. Mm. Uh yeah. Also, this stripper scene, did you did you catch like the music that's playing yeah, in it? Like, I'm not your angel. Like it's the I'm most on I don't know what song it is, but it's the most like on the nose fucking lyrics mm. about like what what's happening in this particular situation. Yeah. I'm not an angel. Mm. I'm just looking for salvation or just like some something absurd like that. Yeah. So uh, like back to Martin Lawrence being possessed. The <laughs> big <laughs> the big failing mm. of this reveal and why it makes it super fucking goofy and laughable when it happens is like you just can't take the sight of Martin Lawrence speaking with John Malkovich's voice seriously. Mm. That's inherently goofy. Mm. And it does look when when we're doing like a like a body swap thing mm. in film and everything like that, there's two ways you go with it. One, you do what they do here, mm. and you have the other person's voice coming out of the body. Or you let the actor inhabit that character. Mm -hmm. And it's all like, how much more interesting would it be if you let Martin Lawrence act like John Malkovich? Like, if uh, you put him in a room, if he really was imagine truly... Imagine that amount of method acting. If he, was, if he really was truly doing the method acting, yeah. that would have been, like, like an interesting thing. Maybe they tried maybe. that, yeah. and then, like, they he just couldn't get just it, so they like just said, fine, we'll just do ADR. Instead, we'll just, he had, like, be, three Big Macs fine. a day. Because and... that's the thing. is like, that's, that's half of the fun. That's, that's the entire reason why those Jumanji sequels made all that money. Mm. It's not because people love the Jumanji lore. It's funny, because, it's funny when Dwayne Johnson pretends he's Danny DeVito. Mm -hmm. That's the entire half of like the co the comedy behind. Even though this is not a comedic movie, yeah. Uh, even though they cast Martin Lawrence, yeah. In it. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, this is this is goofy. Yeah, him doing like this it, evil villainous monologue. It comes out of fucking nowhere. It's Malkovich's it sticks voice. Sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah, and I'm gonna say it makes the movie. It made. The it movie, makes the movie better. It made the movie worthwhile. It Absolutely. made it worth our time to talk about. <laughs> yes. Without this twist, mm. this would be a bit of a wash of an episode because there's really nothing more to say about it other than it's Silence of the Lambs it's seven but it's bad mm -hmm. but this fucking twist yeah and it like, hold, they, hold up and Stay it really with us, folks. and it really is like an 11th hour twist because there's uh, there's sadly not much movie left yeah after this, this twist I would have liked this to have kept, been revealed maybe a little earlier this comes in like the last maybe five minutes of the movie yeah yeah. Yeah. If this movie wanted to have like an ace up its sleeve, mm -hmm. have this be like the midpoint reveal. Yeah. And have a lot more of Martin Lawrence slash Malkovich, Martin Malkovich yeah. running around. I want some Martin Malkovich Lawrence in this Malkovich, movie. Yeah. We need we need a lot more of this. Like have him actually like kill somebody, but he's talking like Malcolm. Yeah. I want to see that. <laughs> That's a because just like because and like the other thing is like Martin Lawrence is taking this way too seriously. So when he comes out from behind the curtain and he's got like his e he's got this he he yeah. he's got like his he's evil his yeah. evil yeah. devil grin on. It's yeah, all like yeah. this is the only time Martin Lawrence is having any fun in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um. And then, yeah, and then the, the artist, uh, you know, like, forces Detective Mary Sue to, to Mary, shoot him. To shoot him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and then... And like, then she, oh, God. Yeah, she shoots him in, like, the <laughs> chest or whatever. It's just enough for... Like, it's, it's it's a killing blow, but it's enough for the tether between John Malkovich and Lawrence. And this movie, to, to this, this part is so funny when Martin Lawrence, like, comes like, to him. What, 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 like, what, what happened? Where Mary, am I? What, what where am I? I? What's going on here? Not... 
ow, there's a giant bullet wound in my fucking chest. I'm dying. Yeah. That's this. That's the obvious reaction anyone would have in this and, situation. And Detective Mary's like, it was the artist. He took control of you, but don't worry. I'm going to get him. And Martin Lawrence isn't like, what? Fucking yeah. what? Wait, what? <laughs> you it's sh- all, you yeah. shot me? He like, literally, he, yeah, he he's literally me? dying <laughs> of a bleeding bullet wound in his chest, right next to his heart. Mm. And his partner says, like, you were possessed by the serial killer that you've spent your life trying to find. And he just, he, he just kind of, like, accepts it, like... Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I had a feeling yeah, this might happen. I had a, that was one of my theories. Yeah. That was one of my working theories, honestly. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, and with his dying breath, he says, "Like you gotta get him. You gotta get the artist. You mm. gotta, you gotta catch him." Yeah. And uh, and then he dies. Yeah. And uh, um, all the murders are pinned on are him. pinned on him, and mm. like he he goes down for it because yeah. no one's. I mean, like, there's never a moment where, like, Detective Mary entertains the possibility of, like, explaining to Sheriff Robert Nepper mm. what happened. Like, it, she immediately is all like, oh, well, well, no one will ever believe this. Yeah. I, I don't believe this. Yeah. If, if this were put into a movie and an the, audience were to watch it, they would, would not believe it. Stupid. Two uh, jackasses yeah. from Canada would have made fun of it on a podcast <laughs> if this were in a movie. Um... But, uh, yeah, and then uh, it, it, it cuts to a funeral. We think maybe it's Martin Lawrence's funeral, but it's actually her father's funeral. Yeah. We find out that. She did go to visit him in a scene that, we, that wasn't not shot. Not important. It wasn't shot. Not important. <laughs> yeah. Wait, why? Are these supposed to be characters here? Yeah. We're supposed to have, like, husband was like, well, it's a good thing you eventually saw your dad before he died. Mm-hmm. Well, nice one uh, on that one. And she, as she's leaving, uh, the Dr. Chilton archetype, mm-hmm. whose name I never bothered to look up, but uh, has been is sitting on a park bench. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she sits down next to him. He's all like, "Ah, oh, Doctor Doctor Chilton type. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what are you doing here? Uh, whose voice comes out of him? <laughs> it's John Malkovich. Oh, uh, it's that again. sneaky Malkovich. He's yeah. all over the place. I've possessed him, and I will continue my great work. And you'll never be able to pin this on me and you stop know, me. You know what I'm just realizing right now? There's a very famous movie about people inhabiting the body of John Malkovich. Yeah. And now there's a movie where John Malkovich... He turns the tables on He turned the table. It's a reverse being John Malkovich. That's why he signed on to this. That's why he signed... That's what he wanted to do. He's all like, you know, like, I I had all of this time where I got to explore what it was like for people to go inside me. Yeah, this is... That was being John Malkovich. Now this is Malkovich being you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) It's going to be really hard not to put that specifically in the show notes <laughs> for this because again I don't want to spoil the twist until mm. this point but uh, yeah. yeah I'm going to have to write around this and being John Malkovich with a twist it on actually <laughs> really is with right down to Malkovich being there yeah um, and this is like the moment where it's all like well he's escaped he's going to continue doing this forever mm. Mm, or not because there's oh, yet another God. twist there's like one final twist there's one super contrived twist where like oh yeah uh, you know that, that care package you just got from a fan that uh, remained anonymous. Yeah, that was me, actually. I put resin in the pencils because I noticed he'd chew your pencils. This this is a thing we've seen throughout the movie. John Malka, the artist, whenever he's doing his art, has a bad habit of chewing on his pencils. His pencils are all are teethy and nom nom mm. up and everything like that. Yeah. And yes, and she's given him black charcoal pencils and she's dipped it in the very same poison he used to kill his victims. Mm-hmm. And and the artist just so happens to wake up from this particular possession. And right here is where the plot, it's it's plot convenience poison, mm-hmm. apparently. It's all like he was poisoned and he was dying, but he didn't realize it until someone told him that that was happening. Yep. And as soon as he learned about it, that's when his body starts going, eh, oh no, yeah. ah. I, have, uh, I have a feeling that was the sort of thing where in the script that they they just kind of leave that as is, and we'll just take that on their word that he is going to die of this. But I have a feeling that John Malkovich, being the weirdo that he is, is you leave the camera on me, I'm going to give you gold as Look, I flail I need, about the, the, the cell, if my destroying character, everything. If my character dies in a movie, I need to have an elaborate death scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this movie Shattered that I just did, but I was stabbed by a fucking katana. Mm-hmm. So you will let me <laughs> knock over all of my easel and art supplies, and you will let me convulse on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I have two Academy Award nominations. Mm-hmm. Not yep. a win. You would think I would have a win, but no, <laughs> yeah. two nominations. Anyway. Third time's a charm. Third time's a charm from Mind Gage. And, it's not too late, Academy. And, uh, yeah, it's implied that uh, uh, Officer Mary and her husband are going to go to the Vatican for a romantic getaway. And much like The Silence of the Lambs, the final shot of this movie is the Dr. Chilton character walking away from the camera. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, like, he, in Silence, he's being followed by Hannibal Lecter, and in this one, the Hannibal Lecter character has died off screen through in his, yeah. 
pencil poison, yeah. but it still <laughs> kills. the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's more or less the same thing, yeah. yes. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, we see this character, I guess, like, snap out of his daze. He kind of, like, looks around and's all like, what am I doing in a, in a cemetery? Well, no follow-up questions, and yeah, he gets, he walks here? away. And then the, the film goes by. But, yes, down to the final fucking shot, this movie rips off Thomas Harris. And it's, enough uh, of a rip-off. Uh, yeah. enough, enough of it. Just enough. Yeah, and that's yeah. the movie. <laughs> that's the movie. Did we not talk about any? I, I don't know. I felt like I talked about it. I got one thing I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um... Who's Dutch? Who is the character of Dutch? Nobody would do this, sir. Dutch has already volunteered. Dutch. But I think Dutch needs some finesse. Sniffer dogs are working the woods. Dutch is on foot and tire print duty, so we should have entry and exit points in no time. He wants to send Dutch in there to see the artist. Dutch was the, the, the cop we saw him kind of like earlier. He was the one that like... Um, tore up the the artist's cell when they like took him for like the uh was that him yeah because he was mentioned like four or five times he, he was like that. he's like really early on in the movie when like martin lawrence comes to, like the first scene he's the cop that's all like you're not gonna like this mm. he's barely a character yeah but he's like a cop that has like a recognizable name they they reference him enough like oh just give that that case to dutch Dutch, don't you think you want to have someone with a little bit more of a finesse? I happen to have a degree in psychology. Maybe I should be yeah. the one to go talk to. They, they, they always badmouth Dutch. They always bring up Dutch. Like Dutch is like probably yeah, he, doing a round of the perimeter. He's the shitty coworker that you don't want on the case. But like, yeah, as a result, they maybe should have given that character like more of a scene, mm-hmm. more of a scene to imply why you don't want yeah, Dutch. Yeah, we the needed case. a face to the name a little earlier on, or maybe he's just like a running theme where like there's this like, ever-present Dutch character that. Always rubs the other officers the wrong way, but he's never actually seen. He, he's like he's like Maris. He's Maris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Detective Maris. There we go. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. That's Mind Cage. Uh, does this movie have a certain something, or is it just a whole lot of nothing? Well, I'll it, tell you one thing. It, it, it has one particular certain something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, I I wouldn't say so. It's a, it's a complete ripoff of Silence of the Lambs. And it's quite boring. Very boring. Yeah. Um, yeah. Without the deft of hand telling that story in a compelling way. Yeah. It's not as moody, uh, not as interesting, not as creepy. Um, it's never creepy. Never creepy. I mean, uh, the the angels are. Uh, I mean, the, I that, mean, the concept that, of them, of that, course, is creepy. But like, it's some interesting design work. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And you know, like the concept of like this serial killer doing all these grotesque experiments on people is creepy. But better movies have done that. Yes. And shown it better. And I'm not going to say I'm numb to something like that because fucking Hannibal freaked me the fuck out mm-hmm. when I was watching that. So, yeah, I know it's just movie itself is you know, not crafted by like a, a, a smarter filmmaker. Yes. Um, uh, but, and other than that amazing twist, which I think people <sighs> fuck, it's like. <laughs> Look, wait, wait like two or three years and actually not even that much. Like wait a couple of months. And I'm sure the scene where Martin Lawrence is speaking with the voice of serial killer John Malkovich. It's going to land just as hard. It'll be on YouTube. And you can yeah. just watch that scene devoid of the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. And that's honestly fine. Yeah. It, it, it is like a delightful cherry on mm. a Sunday that's not a terribly good Sunday. But then it just opens up the door to other questions like, yeah. why didn't he just possess other people each time he wanted to commit a murder? And you just Could kind of, he have possessed yeah. uh, Officer Mary at any point? And also, it's such a great setup. You really shot yourself in the foot by killing the artist off yeah you know like we need this movie needs like an ironic ending where he does get away with it Mm -hmm. and we open the possibility of him possessing other people because i've always loved that idea as a concept the idea of the assassin or the killer that possesses other bodies that was that great movie from two years ago possessor Mm -hmm. that's largely about that idea but like yeah i mean like because that's always the that's always like that's like, that's that's how you get away with it. That's the only mm. way you get away with murdering someone is if you literally force someone else to do the murder for yeah. you. And it, it's a really creepy idea mm. that uh, uh, movies are starting to yeah. write stories about. But At least like, for something like that, they hang their entire premise of the movie on it. They don't shoehorn it in in the last five minutes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's like a possibility for a mind cage too. Maybe like John Malkovich like. 
jumped into the mind of someone else as his as his mind was no, leaving it, his body or whatever, and now he's like prequel. trapped in somebody. I don't know. It'll be one of those bullshit like you know, rush sequels. Uh, but you need to get you need to get like someone who's like a lower grade Martin Lawrence. Like you need, I need that voice to come out of uh, of an actor that you don't expect yeah. to come out of or anything like that. Like get Cat Williams for mine for Mine Cage Two, yeah, uh, or something like that. Mm. But you got you got to keep Malkovich. Malkovich, yeah. you, you need you need like a comedian with an iconic voice. It's a shame Gilbert Godfrey passed away. Oh my God! <laughs> would watch an entire movie of that. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, make Mind Cage too, because uh, as this past couple of years have proven, our our our, sta- our great stand-ups are all dropping like flies. Mm. Like, yeah, get get I don't know, get someone in there. Mm. Yeah, they're either dropping like flies or they're canceling themselves. So yeah, you know, like true. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was Mind Cage, mm. directed by Mauro Borelli. It sure, you, shit was. If you liked this episode, please listen to our other episodes. Uh, there you can find them on Spotify or on YouTube and. Uh, if you watch them on YouTube, there's the, this visual element to it that will give you clips and uh, clips from the show. Uh, Jameson works really hard on that. Uh, you can follow us on all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you know, we're on there. There'll be links to new episodes when that drops. Uh, if you're listening through our back catalog and you get to a point where all like, hey, where did nothing movies go? Uh, the show used to be called The Fuck Is This. It's basically the exact same show. So, you know, like you, you have like a whole bunch of other episodes. We're we coming. back catalog. We're Check coming up on 100. We're coming. Yeah. Within this year, we will have our 100th episode, which is a wild thing to consider. But mm, we'll cross that bridge. When we come to it, we'd like to thank Joel Flynn and Luke Schuss and everyone at Pod Stream Studios for letting us use their equipment. We'd like to thank Eddie Lamb for his fantastic theme music. Next episode, we'll be wrapping up the Nothing Movies of 2022. Until then, I'm Kaz. I'm Jameson. And hey, get some rest. That was it? That was the only good line from this movie? No, there's a couple one. I, I just thought there was a pretty good sign-off phrase, get some rest. Uh, what, was, what did he say here? It was, um, a winged friend told me when he wasn't a bird. Uh, I want to I want to throw my two cents in and add this with uh, one final piece from the IMDb trivia. Oh, okay. During a police investigation at a crime scene, Jake Doyle and Mary Kelly notice writing on a wall written in a foreign language. Jake asks Mary if the writing is in German. Martin Lawrence oh. was born in Germany. He would know That's it. not a trivia fact. Whoever wrote that, mm. I'm I'm not finding that interesting. I'm giving you a I'm giving you a thumbs down right now. Okay. Here's another one that I had that. Uh... Okay, we ended the episode five minutes ago. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, fuck like. <laughs> So, yeah. So they don't want to commute. Um, John the strongest Malkovich. ending ever. Please go. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna trim this. I keep, in, I keep interrupting. No, it's all staying in. They don't want to. They don't want to uh, commute his sentence. So they said, "How about we'll just give you like more time in the yard?" And he says, uh, "I abhor physical exertion of any kind." Then why did you become a serial killer who's famous for putting up these creepy yard installations? You know what? That's the final note. All right. Thank That's you for listening to the show from from two hosts. To abhor physical exertion of any kind. Good night. And get some rest. <laughs> and I will splash the pot whenever I damn well please. Pay that man his money. Ah!